In an era where the mystical allure of psychedelics is being rediscovered and their therapeutic potential is gaining recognition, HPLC emerges as the unsung hero, unraveling the mysteries hidden within these mind-altering substances. This sophisticated analytical technique serves as the compass guiding researchers, scientists, and enthusiasts through the uncharted territories of psychedelics, ensuring safety, potency, and the unlocking of their full therapeutic potential. So go grab your lab coats, because tonight we sit down with three pioneer scientists who laid the foundation for all the early work in HPLC testing in our underground myco community. We will discuss where we are at and where we need to go, addressing many issues surrounding HPLC testing, uh, borrowing heavily from the lessons learned and still being learned in the cannabis industry. Get ready for a roller coaster ride of insight, discovery, and enlightenment as we unravel the importance of HPLC testing in the ever evolving landscape of psychedelics. Tonight, we're going beyond the spectrum to fully contextualize HPLC in the full swing of the psychedelic renaissance. You're listening to the Michael Geeky Podcast. A podcast that inspires people to grow mushrooms at home to improve their mental, emotional, and physical health. Most people call him geeky, and he is a passionate mushroom cultivator, advocate, and educator. Every week, he sits down with fellow cultivators, mushroom educators, scientists, and therapists to discuss the various ways people can approach mushroom cultivation and how mushrooms can be used to improve their lives. All right, what's up, everybody? Welcome to the Michael Geeky Podcast, the podcast that goes deep so you can level up your at-home mushroom cultivation game. I'm your host, Michael Geeky, and tonight we have a wonderful show. We have three expert scientists who are working, running HPLC labs uh, within the mushroom space here. They are testing uh, active mushrooms. They are testing functional mushrooms uh, for various active compounds. Uh, and we are going to go super deep tonight. Um, if you guys uh, have been a fan of the show for a while, you know that we, we had George Selhorn of Flourish Labs and Jordan Jacobs of Trip Labs on about a year ago. And we covered some of the basics, you know, what is HPLC, what might we do with it, all that good stuff. And so now it's been a year. There are a lot more labs out there. There are, there have been just uh, uh, a boom in, in potency cups. And so uh, I have been very interested for, for a while now to have some of these guys on uh, to round table and discuss what they do, why they do what they do, why what they do is important, and how people like us might better understand what they do and figure out how to pick the right people to uh, choose for a potency testing center. So anyway, we're going to do that. It's going to be great. This is not a short episode, guys. So, uh, you know, go grab yourselves a cup of coffee. Um, go grab a notebook and a pen because there's going to be a lot of information on this one. We're, we're going to school tonight. But before we do that, um, I just want to shout out my Patreon supporters. You guys are amazing. Um, I am really enjoying connecting with you guys from all over the world. Um, it's really cool to see so many people growing mushrooms in so many parts of uh a lot of continents growing mushrooms, a lot of people growing them, a lot of, not just picking them, but growing them. And that's what I like to see. Um, I, I really believe in this medicine and I am here for you guys to help figure out how to grow it. So uh, shout out to my Patreon supporters. If you guys want to support me on Patreon, it's very easy. Um, just go to a web browser, type in the word Patreon, type in the word Michael Geeky, click on the first link that shows up and uh, you're good to go. So Anyway, I would appreciate it if you'd consider supporting me. If you can support me for a month and then you can't support me for five months, that's fine. If you can support me all the time, great. I'm here all the time for you guys. Uh, I'm, uh, you know, three kids, job, all that good stuff. Uh, every week I'm showing up for you guys and I'm doing it because I truly believe this community needs a place to go to figure out who are the good, good, good players? Who, who are the, the ethical vendors? Who are the people that have the right information for me? That's what I'm trying to provide you guys. So that's, we're going to keep doing it. I, I don't see, uh, I do not see the train slowing down anytime soon. Anyway, so also want to shout out uh, my Discord server, uh, hopping and, and bopping over there. Uh, did some giveaways. It's been a good time. 
Um, what else we got going on this week? Oh, uh, I believe our our buddy uh, Stealthy Spores is about to release the um, his new uh, trading card game. Which hold on, let me grab this thing here. I wasn't going to talk about this, but I will. You know, Geeky made the cut. I'm happy about that. Um, hopefully, you guys, you can win, win some games playing on uh, my card. That'll be fun. Who else have we got in here? We got some other awesome people of our Myco community. Let me pull a few up here. I don't know what, who we got. All right. You know, James Cruz uh, of, of the Gates' Cruz. We got old 92nd Mycology. They tried to kick him, but but he came back. We got PGT. What do we got? We got, uh, oh no, we just got a bunch of other. Okay, here's a couple finally. We got Dave Wombat, which by the way, um, guess who's going to be on the show next week? Right there, Dave Wombat. And then my buddy, Dichotomous Keys. Now, speaking of Dichotomous Keys, um, I had a guy reach out to me this week, and they said, hey, you know, I'm putting together a little, little fungi fest, a little, little mushroom festival here. Um, people are going to mushroom festivals now. This is absolutely a thing. This is not just for, like, some super nerdy taxonomists, um, which, no offense, I'm, I'm one of those two. Um, but, man, mushroom festivals, this is what's up right now. I'm, I'm telling you. I went to a few of them last summer nothing but fun and uh so anyway uh this guy reached out to me and he said hey I i'm doing this thing in colorado uh let me tell you about it so i said i love that how about you come on how about you tell everybody about it so let's do this let's pull him on his name is rob tillery uh and he is with a company called blazing events what's up rob how you doing today man i'm i'm over here living the american dream in my basement one day at a time how about you Oh, I'm doing well, doing well. Great. Well, so do this. Why don't you tell us what's going on in Colorado? What, what, what do you got going on for the summer? Well, Colorado has decriminalized mushrooms like a lot of other places. And the whole mycology and um, growing aspect of it is really gaining popularity in the area. Um, I was putting together a cannabis event for 420, and one of the main sponsors was Mycomed's Fungi Supply out of Pueblo, and he was like, hey, we should do a fungi event. I like so it. I got to looking around, and um, there's a lot of people attending his grow classes and other grow classes. And I started talking with other mycologists about how they're using it for PTSD and trauma therapy. And then I found a whole population of people that are microdosing. And um, I started asking about microdosing and what people are doing and what their regiment was. And I started wondering when does microdosing become dosing and so that was like a, a, a debatable question in this field of mycology and so then i talked with uh dichotomous keys and he agreed to be our our keynote speaker love it and so he'll be doing a class on advanced mycology and crossbreeding Wow. And so for the, I, I'm, I'm going to tell you right now, I think that'll be unprecedented uh, in, in the, the, the fungi festival space, having somebody doing uh, a, a workshop like that. So that's great. Shout out to Dichotomous Keys. Um, so you came from the cannabis space and correct. you, you, you know, you're not the only one from the cannabis space going. So what's up with these mushrooms and, and, and discovering that there's a lot going on and there's a huge population of people so i think this is great you're doing an event i i tell people every day there is no short supply of enthusiasm around mushrooms right now so whether you're creating content on youtube whether you got a new instagram channel or in in your case you're going to host uh, a, 
a, a mushroom festival, people are going to come. It, it, so, so as soon as you, you reached out to me, I was like, I like it. This is great. Let's tell people about it. So, so when are you thinking? Do you have a date set yet? Yeah, the date is June 1st. Okay. Is it and one day or is it multi-day? Well, to be honest, we're still um, putting together the speakers and schedule of events. Okay. Um, everything I've spoke about already is things we have on the menu, so to speak. Right. Um, there will be a talk on PTSD, but we're expanding it into foraging and non-psychedelic mushrooms, Great. like with a cooking demonstration. And um, the the day's being built as a as a holistic day, so there's also other people not in the mycology area, but like in right. uh, in trauma therapy or mindfulness yeah. or meditation. And as this thing keeps expanding, we might be on to Sunday and June 2nd by the time we get there. I like that. So this is interesting, and I didn't know this. So I'm, I'm glad we're talking about it. So, you know, a lot of these mushroom festivals, they are – they're very broad, so they they always include forays and hikes and, you know, let's go explore the area, let's go look for some mushrooms. This is, it's been a new thing to include um, more holistic outlooks, you know, like how are people are using functional mushrooms to to medicate, to improve their health, all this kind of stuff. But it sounds like your your real angle, the thing that got you excited was the healing properties of of mushrooms. And it seems like that's this great theme. So you got integration, you, you, you got uh, mindfulness, you got meditation, you got, you're probably going to have to get some yoga people out there too. You have we to actually, get some massage therapists out there. We, we actually do. Uh, on our event page on Facebook, um, the SoCo Fungi Fest, we've already um, announced that there are two different yoga instructors Oh, who are going to do 30 minutes of free flow yoga um, for the group, for attendees, if they want to bring their yoga mats. Nice. Um, there's also a girl who's going to do a, a breath work session. Yeah. Great. And um, I believe there's somebody who's going to be doing Reiki massages. Nice. Okay. So, yeah, we are trying to incorporate more of this holistic day. Um, I, I honestly come from a academic background, and I've been to conferences where they're solely focused on one subject, and it tends to get a little routine and stale. Yeah, I'm with you. So we want, I, I think it's great. I think how you're so doing we, that's great. Yeah, so we wanted to kind of broaden the spectrum. Um and bring in these other genres that kind of fit the whole holistic theme that the mushrooms are bringing to people. I like that. Now, so we were talking about this, and this is particularly why I said, well, let's just bring you on the show so we can let everybody know. So this is still, you're still developing it. It's still growing. You're bringing in vendors. You're bringing in speakers. You're bringing in workshop concepts things like that is Correct. right you're, you're you're still trying to grow this so this is great there's a lot of people listening to to the show um if if you guys out there want to be a part of this this is in colorado are you're based out of colorado springs is that correct correct the event is actually being held in manitou which is like kind of connected to colorado springs cool okay. it's at it's, it's at the inhale resort and spa okay and uh, I found the place because it's a cannabis-friendly resort. Nice. Okay. Well, that'll cannabis-friendly usually will also mean you, you know mushroom-friendly, psychedelic-friendly. So that's cool. It turned out they were very fungi-friendly. Nice. Love it. So, all right, guys. So, anybody watching who who has a business it, it is uh, doing anything related to mushrooms, functional mushrooms, medicinal mushrooms. Whether you're a, a trip sitter, uh, uh, you know, you, you do a yoga, you do meditation, you do uh, th any sort of therapy, you 
whatever you do that's related to this, if you are interested in cruising up to uh, Colorado Springs this summer, uh, you said in June or July? June 1st. June 1st. All right. Easy to remember. June 1st, guys. Um, possibly June 2nd if we get enough people interested here. So um, I'm going to have all of Rob's information in the description. Um, he's on Facebook. He's He's got a Facebook page for the event, which is uh, SoCo Fungi Fest 2024. So, man, I, I think this would be great. I, I love the idea of having people watching this go wow, I got a chance to get in. This is not just to participate. This is, I got a chance to be a part of this. I got a chance to vend at this, to connect with customers, to connect with people in this space. So if you guys are interested, uh, reach out to Rob. Um, I, I'm probably going to have to go, man. I mean, if my buddy Dichotomous Keys is going to be there, how can I not go? So, uh, yeah. Well, there's, there's one more bonus. After dark, we have a, um, Video set to music, laser okay. show starting after awesome. dark. So I, I I appreciate your call out for trip sitters. Yeah, yeah. Um, if there's anyone out there who might be able to guide a lost soul during our video show, please contact us. Yes. Yeah. So I think that's wonderful, especially that it's at this Inhale Resort and Spa that they're they're fungi friendly that you you know some of that stuff could be coordinated in advance even that that's really cool and i mean you can't have a mushroom festival without having some sort of musical event uh in the evening gotta happen gotta happen right during the day everybody's perusing the booths going attending workshops going on forays doing all that stuff and then at night everybody's ready to have a good time connect uh you know get to know people uh on that musical intuitive level so that's that's really cool man um, why don't you give people a little bit more of a, a idea of your background? Uh, so what did you do in the cannabis space? Um, what do you do? Um, you know, that sort of thing. Well, myself, I started in 2009 when, uh, Colorado started allowing dispensaries Okay. and the dispensaries were not growing for themselves yet. So, um, I became the first medical marijuana producer in Southern Colorado with contracts to grow medical marijuana for oh, the cool. dispensaries. Nice man. Um, a after that, I, I started distributing other cannabis products and then that led to me being familiar with a lot of the dispensary owners and we started we put together an event called the Greenleaf Expo. Okay. So that was my first event in the cannabis industry. And then when we went recreational, the uh, laws were made it so that we could smoke in public. Right. And so I started an event with a group called Club 710 and um, started hosting their events and finding venues for them in cannabis friendly venues. Very cool. I like that. I mean, so you you you've done this in the cannabis space. You know what you're doing. You're going to put on a good show. I I love it. I'm I'm excited. Uh I really think uh it says a lot that you reached out to Dichotomous Keys. Um I'm hoping by June I think he's going to be in Colorado. Um he, Correct. Yes, yeah, so that's great. What a what a great Welcome to Dichotomous Keys uh, in the Colorado. That's going to be very cool. Um, and I'm pretty sure you're, I know there is a lot of people that watch my show who are in Colorado. Um, so if, if, if nothing else, you're going to get all sorts of uh, attention just, just from, from attendees. But man, I really hope that all the people that are in Colorado uh, or nearby, man, I would be doing this event. I don't know. Uh, I don't know how, how they feel. I can tell you this. As soon as I started doing some events this summer, it just feels good to get out there and connect with people uh, in the mushroom space. Right. It, it, it's still a little bit underground. Uh, it's easy to feel isolated and, and, and separate and don't know how to connect with people. And this is a great event to, to actually connect with people in, in a, a decriminalized uh, state. 
Yeah, man, get out there, do it. I, I, I commend you for putting this together um, and, and, and building something great. Uh, I, I hope every single thing that you learn from cannabis, you bring into this, this mushroom festival. Cause I, I don't know about you. I know a lot of people in this space love going to these things and are just looking for, you, you know, what, what's the next event I can go to? What, what's the next trip I can go on? What's the next way that I can connect with people that love mushrooms as, as much as I do. So that it's really great. You're putting this on, man. Well, I appreciate you having me on and letting me talk about this. And um, if anyone wants to get involved, there's still room. We would really like to add a second day on. We've had a lot of good reception so far. I've got um, someone who goes by my Colorado gen genetics. They are going to mm -hmm. be doing a talk on um, advanced or maybe intermediate mycology on using mm -hmm. agar and proper use of a flow hood. Nice. And the uh, Mycomeds fungi supply will be doing basic grow classes. Wow. So you really, you're going to have, I mean, for people that are looking to, there are a lot of people in the space who are trying to teach people who are trying to, you know, sell, sell myco supplies for people who are growing. And it sounds like you got all sorts of cool workshops for those people. Um, I think this is going to be good. I like it. Yeah. We're, we're really trying, we're, we're trying to present it from the basic to the, uh, intermediate and advanced stages for each of the mycologists out there listening that want to learn the next step in what they're doing. That's awesome. Hands on, then, in person, rolling up your sleeves and doing it. I love it. It's awesome. Yeah the the um, the 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 agar class is going to be able to like actually take a petri dish home with them. Nice. Very cool. All right, man. Well, so, and, and as you get more people booked, you know, let me know. We'll, we'll make sure everybody knows who, who's, you know, going to be there. And if, if you get the second day book, let me know. We'll let everybody know, you know, what the full schedule looks like and all that stuff. And, and just try to uh, keep supporting you here. Yeah. Maybe sometime in the end of May, I'll come back on and let you know where we've progressed to. Perfect. Sounds good. And in the meantime, all the ways to get a hold of Rob will be in the description. Um, and he's got a Facebook page for the event, uh, which if you just search SoCo Fungi Fest 2024, you should be able to find it. And you can reach out that way as well. So anyway, uh, thanks for showing up, uh, letting everybody know what's going on. And I can't wait to uh, can't wait to see how this event unfolds, man. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Uh, my pleasure. Take care. All right, guys, that was Rob Tillery of Blazing Events. Um, hopefully, you guys, if you guys are in Colorado, you get a chance to check out the SoCo Fungi Fest 2024. Should be a good time. That's going to be hosted at Inhale Resort and Spa. Um, get out there, guys. You got to get, you got to, you got to connect. You got to myceliate. You got to make those clamp connections. Um, so uh, if you guys want to check out I think I'm going to be there. I'm going to do my best. Uh, Dichotomous Keys, if you want to check him out, he's going to be there. And uh, I'm sure a bunch of other amazing people. And as we find out more, I will let you guys know. So we got that coming up. But I would say it's about time we got a long show. We better get into it. So let's uh, let's do this. So before we roundtable with, with these scientists, I think it would be fair that we take a little time to get to know each one find out a little bit about them, their background, why they're qualified to do what they do, uh, what their labs are currently up to. And then once we kind of bounce through those three uh, segments, then we're going to get straight into the round table. So let's do it. All right. Welcome to the show. Ian Bollinger. What's up, man? Man, another beautiful day, another chance to educate and share what beautiful knowledge I've been able to garner. That's what I say to my children. I say, welcome, children. Um, put that down. Don't touch that. Clean up this. And let me bestow upon you all my wisdom of life. Yes. I mean, standing on the shoulders of giants, you know? There you go. Standing on the shoulders of just everybody else. Yeah. Um, all right. So let's do this. So I imagine a lot of people watching uh, know exactly who you are. I imagine some people watching maybe have literally no clue who you are. So 
paint the picture. Let everybody know who you are, what what you do, uh, where you came from, and what you've been up to in, in our in our little micro community that we're all a part of here. Absolutely. Um, most people know me, Ian Bollinger, through my work with Hyphae Labs, um, where we were the first psilocybin mushroom testing company, both that we're aware of in the United States that was above ground, focusing specifically on entheogenic mushrooms. Um, I was the science backbone behind the psilocybin cup for the first five cups that we put on, um, ensuring that we both had methods that I believed were robust, but also reproducible in meaningful ways and expanding the conversation from not just psilocybin and psilocin into the entourage, or as I like to say, ensemble of other compounds available within the mushrooms. Um, also trying to highlight the fact that it's not about the most potent mushroom as well, that we don't necessarily have to have a first, second, third place hierarchy, but we could flip that on its side and create a scale or spectrum of use. And I, I developed the high phase spectrum, which was trying to associate certain dosage ranges with certain desirable outcomes, whether it be microdosing, recreational, therapeutic, or spiritual use. And so that's kind of my claim to fame, Would if I would argue or choose to toot my horn, as I jokingly say, uh, I could die happy as doing something fairly, I believe, at least important in starting conversations. And that's always been my goal is to at least provide a sounding board or a baseboard for people to have educated science conversations, specifically around entheogens and mushrooms and those things within mushrooms that they're choosing to seek. Yeah, Hyphae Labs, right? You you guys you guys set the bar, you guys set the tone. I remember, I forget which year it was where all of a sudden I'm like, oh, and what's Ian doing? Not, now we got a microdose category. Now we got a this category. And I just said, I like I like the shift. This is not just a raw who got the most of it. And this this is let's think about this a little more intelligently. I think the evolution is fantastic. So you did work, you did five five cups with them. Yes, uh, I finished up the last cup uh, this last December. Um, and honestly, I will say um, the hardest thing that I've come to realize when it comes to mushrooms, it's understanding the ranges of potency within even a single lineage. I think that's, it's, 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 we are in the infancy of this. Um, and I believe that there's a lot of not just low hanging fruit, but also opportunity for those of us as citizen scientists, because that's where I believe I started out. Like most people don't consider a scientist unless you have a PhD, PhD, MD. Um, most, the, most people doing work in this space right now, specifically either around entheogens or uh, even mushrooms, are people that have at best maybe bachelors in science. At best, some people, some of the best cultivators I know didn't even graduate high school, you know? hell, aren't even from this country, so being the United States. Um, and so that being said, I feel like that there's something, there's this unique space that uh, we're in where citizen scientists, if you will, are really leading conversations in this mushroom space. And I'm here to do my best to provide those citizen scientists with not just, um, a, again, a solid backboard to spring forth from, but also a basis to fall back on. So, HPLC, to, l tell me about your capacity. What, what, what compounds do you have protocols for? What, what, you know, what fruit are you looking to juice up and extract and, and figure out what, what's actually in there. What ones do you get asked about that you are, you don't mess with? Like, I think that would be good for the audience to know, just like, what can I come to Ian with? What can he test for? I will honestly say my goal at Hyphae Labs was to provide as deep a profile into mushrooms as I could. Um, specifically, we were looking at, when I left, we didn't just have the, the psilocybin cup, we had the hyphae cup. We were looking at adenosine and cordycepin and a couple of other compounds within um, cordyceps mushrooms as well. And so I really um, stress the 
importance of full profiles when we're talking about mushrooms. So when we were coming to Cubensis, we were testing up to 18 compounds. Granted, we weren't seeing many of the more nuanced ones like 5-hydroxytryptamine, 5-MeO, or sorry, 5-hydroxydimethyltryptamine, 5-hydroxy, uh, 5-methoxy dimethyltryptamine, 5-MeO DMT. We had protocols to test those, but we weren't necessarily seeing those in samples, in mushroom samples. But we were able to say, if somebody gave us a, a toad extract or a synthetic compound, we were able to test for those as well. Furthermore, um, for acetoxy, dimethyltryptamine, psilocetin is another name for it, um, or 4-ACO DMT, or O- Acetyl silicin, so many names for the same compound. Um, it's the synthetic that um, is, is shown up in a number of different um, chocolate bars. And honestly, I've seen it in fruits as well as like a either added to the substrate and it's still um, on the mushroom or sprayed. I, I don't know which, but it's I've seen it in mushrooms as well. So being able to differentiate between a natural product and a synthetic product was one of those things that we did our best to try to provide information on as well. Um, I will state um, currently my main goal is not necessarily to dive in deep or help people to dive in deep on compounds, but to, get, again, with the Center for Mycoanalytics, which is our current educational platform that we're working to provide people access to testing at a psilocybin, psilocin, adenosine, cordycepin level, um, we want to teach people how to test for those. So as if they can understand that, then you will be able to better understand what norbeocystin is or, or norcilocin is and how those compounds fit into the big picture. You need to really have a foundation first, and that's kind of the goal of what we're trying to teach, um, not just at the Center for Mycoanalytics, but also um, just generally with me wanting to speak to the public. I always am speaking to the person that is either consuming the mushroom or trying to grow their own as compared to the person that has 400 bags in their house or their, or their, or their grow room. You know what I'm saying? Like those are the, those people, I hope they get something out of my data or my conversations, but fundamentally I want to be talking to the people consuming or producing for themselves or their communities. I love that. So, so that is the aim. Maybe go a little bit more into your vision for center for mycoanalytics. Like I, you, you just, you explain that piece, but give me the, the, give me the full picture just so everybody understands how that fits within what, what you're up to. So our goal is to become a 501c3. We have applications ready and going. We just need to run it by our tax person um, and to become a, so I jokingly make this analogy. Did you know that the NFL was a nonprofit up until 2015? Yeah, you know, and the only reason why they didn't was because they're like, yeah, I guess we do have tax liabilities we should pay. So we'll stop. You know, it was it was because of pressure that they changed. Um, but the way it worked was the NFL provided rules. They provided referees. They provided the tournaments or the or the conferences and they lobbied local areas or big cities for stadiums to get built for franchises to be able to come in but if you look at like the green bay packers they're owned by green bay you know the dallas cowboys are a privately owned franchise and so our goal with the center for microanalytics is to be like an nfl we'll provide you SOPs, we'll provide you instructors, we'll provide you, and we will fight for um, the ability to get you an instrument or a space that's a community space where you can come in and learn these skills to be able to see what it looks like to run an HPLC. So to see what data comes off looks like and to see all the other peaks that are on there that you're like, well, I would like to know more about it. And then you can reach out to either the other groups, Hyphae Labs, Tryptomics, George Selhorn at um, Flourish Labs, uh, Jordan up at Trip Labs, or any of the other groups that you've mentioned before that are able to do testing. My hope is to inform the public more because it took us 10 years to get to where we are with cannabis. I would like to maybe start uh, having those conversations a little bit earlier. It's important because like we were, you know, beforehand, we were talking a little bit about this. Um, I mean, we're just seeing the ripples of the tidal wave. 
that that's that's about to come. And so if if this groundwork is not laid now, then the tidal wave comes, everybody gets wet, everybody drowns, everybody's house goes, you know, willy nilly. We, we gotta we gotta fill the sandbags now. We gotta get the levees supported. We gotta do all that stuff to be ready for this in this influx that we're maybe only now just starting to see trickle in and everybody thinks oh man it, it, it's not even here yet wait wait till you got full decrim wait till you got legalization wait till big pharma starts playing games wait till all the stigma associated with psychedelics in general starts to turn into a lot of excitement for you know mental health research uh other you know how do we use psilocybin to treat traumatic brain injury and the sky's the limit because we're just starting to look into this stuff like we should have done 50 years ago. So um, Emily Davis, who is one of the founders of the Center for Microanalytics, got to present some of the work that we've been able to do and the directions that we're taking things. Um, and to a, uh, I'm not going to say the group because I don't want to be too, judge too, I don't want to say judgmental, but too critical of uh, the conversation. But one of the questions that was asked to her was, so do you see entheogens or psychedelic mushrooms being more of a business model or a medical model? And it's just like, okay, so those are the only two options. Like there aren't other models that we could, and honestly, those were the only ones they were concerned with. And that to me, it's like, okay, well, that's very telling of the spaces that we're going to be seeing start to come up. And it's interesting because most people asking those questions haven't done much work with these things and, and it, it shows. And it's the funny thing about mushrooms is they tend to, they thrive in bullshit. They don't, they don't, you know, so it's like if somebody starts, if somebody starts putting out bullshit, the mushrooms are just going to decompose that down in a heartbeat. And so this is one of the reasons why I think it's like a, a ironically, it's like a self cleaning mechanism for some communities. Um, however, uh, it, it requires uh, communities to spend time with these mushrooms. And that's the thing. It's like most people that are getting hoodwinked or, or being exposed to this at the entry point are the ones that are likely to be get caught off by either snake oil salesmen or charlatans. And so it's, those people exist. Those people are always going to exist. And so our community, uh, the most important thing we can do for our community is to fundamentally just be ourselves, present what we know as humbly as we can, and try to do our best to learn from the mistakes that we make, especially when we don't realize we're making them. Oh, those are great moments. Yes. Easy, easy to tell the glorious story of your ego death right afterwards, full of pride, beaming. Oh, my ego death. Oh, I mean, I heard about yours, but my ego death was amazing. Rather to go, wow, tell me more about yours. You know, I mean, I had one, but I want to hear what yours was like. Like just, just a little more humility, a little more open-mindedness. It's a hundred percent very much the, um, the biggest thing again, like I, I, my friend, I, interestingly enough though, there are also people in this community that I know who don't find ego death in mushrooms, but they also, cause these are non-specific amplifiers. Some people, some people, yeah, need to be humbled. I do not disagree. Some people do. And, and if they're talking about how they are, have been humbled, they haven't been humbled enough. Um, but there's also people whose entire life has been a humbling experience and they need an ego strengthening. And I dare say that that's one of those things that, that is not brought up in these spaces in a meaningful way. Like they are non-specific amplifiers. So it's like, if you're going in needing an ego death, you might not get it. You might still get an ego amplifier because you're trying to find something. If you let go, if you release, if you let the mushrooms do the work, decay, rot, whatever you want to say, you know, however you want to verbalize it or however you want to phrase it, um, new life comes from this. Like there's a comedian that has a really great bit. He's like microdosing mushrooms, whatever, ha like who came up with this idea? You're supposed to eat a, a handful of mushrooms, go into the woods and come out a totally different person. 
It's like, yeah, that's kind of the 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 gist of what mushrooms have been helpful for in the grand scheme of things. And so my hope is always to make sure anybody that chooses to go down that path, macro dose, micro dose, whatever, they have at least a background to inform that through either data or logic, because those things are the things that I believe are the most irrefutable. Most people in the space, they are trying to capitalize, 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 capitalize. And here you're, you're sitting back going, you know what we need to do though? We need to teach. We need to educate all these capitalists coming in here. All these low wannabe capitalists, they might need to learn a few things. And wouldn't it be great if I started the center for microanalytics and they could learn a little bit more, they could learn how to make better decisions. They could just get, get maybe a, a better ability to discern truth reason logic science versus snake oil charlatanism all that kind of stuff the wolves in sheep's clothing that are roaming around the grass all the time the green metaphoric grass they hide so well in and then we hear the sad stories and you get to be the guy who comes up and pulls the grass away and says that's a wolf that is not a sheep guys yes i love that i think that's wonderful and it's not just me, but it's also the community of people that I get to be peers with, you know, the George Selhorns, the Caleb Kings, the Jordan Jacobs, you know, these are the people that are just as capable of having a conversation in this space as I am. Yeah, I'm capable of talking about it in a different way. I'm capable of talking about it in a, uh, probably from a different perspective even. However, the knowledge base that it requires to even get to where any of us are is fundamentally the same and the thing that we can provide as peers is a, again a reference point like i i literally would fall back on my community like if i was talking bullshit i would expect somebody to, to be like no no that's not right and i'd be like fair enough i would rather be wrong and corrected than stay wrong and so holding space for that and being able to not like I, again, one of the hardest things I've learned from education is like some people don't want to look wrong or can't even imagine being wrong. Um, I appreciate the classrooms that we have with the Center for Microanalytics. We taught 25 students this past year, um, and I was very honored with a space where you know I could be writing a chemical structure on the board, and somebody's like, "Oh yes, isn't there a nitrogen there?" And I'm like, "This is absolutely correct." And that's one of those things that's helpful for people when they're learning as well to be like expressing what they do know especially when there's space for growth together um and i think that there's some greatness in recognizing i, I translate my name in japanese iam greatness and ideas not because i have great ideas i'm here to show others the greatness of their own and and there's so much power in letting a person learn at their own pace or through their own lens and doing your best to listen, not for the answer you want, but the answer they're giving. I love that. I So I also love this. I'm trying to think of, of a great way to explain this that, that's making sense in my head, but but let me try this. So there's no better way to prepare for a test than to pretend to be the teacher. There's no better way to, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking I had to take an anatomy class uh, when I went back to school to be a nurse, and uh, I, I crushed that class. I crushed it because I went into the lab and I got the skeleton out and I got the, the little organ pieces out and people would show up in the lab and go, oh, I got to study. And I would go, well, this is this, this is this, this is this, this is this. And so I took on the role of teacher and I was just galvanizing my, my knowledge. I was just, by, by, do, by doing, being a part of a doing process rather than being the sponge and sucking it all up, I retained that information better. So I love this model of, I mean, some of these guys, are they all going to go by HPLCs? Probably not. But are they going to be better consumers of an HPLC lab by understanding that process and learning how to do some of this? Oh, my God, yes. I mean, it's if I had 
if I had $5 million and investors saying, make me a return on my money, I would absolutely go take that class and go teach me about this. I need to understand this better because when I start picking who I'm going to do, do work with, I don't want to be a bumbling buffoon. I don't want to be hoodwinked and, and tricked and, and lied to. I want to know enough about this so that when you, you're saying something that doesn't make any sense, I can go, yeah, I don't think that's right. Or you're seeing numbers that are a little bit, a little bit high and you could be like poking around like, Oh, well, how did you go about extracting? Oh, well, we did, we have this, this, and it's like, interesting, interesting. That doesn't back up the data that I know, because that's the, one of the big things that we love about the class is there are aha moments baked in when looking at different extraction solutions. Um, furthermore, we're going to be working to teach an online course as well, which is hopefully going to try to inform people about the differences between, you know, looking at with your own eye and observing something and then c using a computer to analyze something. And trying to understand the the variability just in that space. I love that. It's needed. It's necessary because you got just, I mean, on one level, right? Even just what I was doing, I'm talking to all these people, I'm getting little gems here and there from our conversation. And, and after the call, I'm thinking to myself, God, I should start recording these. These are great, man. People need to hear this. And then I'm watching a Joe Rogan one day and I go, oh, I, yeah, so let's just do this. This is this is how we get the information out there. People need to have the aha moments. They they need to. Nobody likes going to traditional school anymore. Nobody wants to learn that way. People like to learn differently. People are not afraid now to go. Yeah, I can just read a book. Just reading the book doesn't work. Now, I mean, sometimes you got to read the book, but. I love that you're doing even online classes because not everybody can come to you and you're not going to be able to go to everybody. So online, very necessary. And and if you can have a product that gets people even a little bit closer to making better decisions, you have provided, you've done that one other thing to give back to the community. One more thing. It's always one more thing, in my opinion. And I think that's the best. It's a... Uh... I, th I think I mentioned this um, offline the other day. Um, as a huge anime fan, um, uh, Boku no Hero Academia, or My Hero Academy in English, has the concept of plus ultra, you know, going over 100%. And this is one of those things that um, I think is unique to willpower. And uh, human beings being a very strong bastion of willpower allows us to tap into that and try to be like, okay, I mean, you're a father of three, you understand. Sometimes you, you're you tapped out, but you still got to give. Um, and that's something that willpower and discipline teach us. The funny thing about science is um, repetition gives you confidence to be able to have willpower or be able to stand behind questions or be able to sniff out like you're saying earlier the snake oil that's great well man I, I this is good i think people got a, a a sense of you and what center for michael analytics are are all about um we're gonna have the you know all the links in the in the description so if anybody wants to do more know more connect with ian it's all going to be there um we're going to keep doing all these uh intros and then we're going to get into the round table. All right, man. Thank you so much. And uh, yeah, roundtable uh, coming up here. All right. Welcome to the show. George Selhorn of Flourish Labs. What's up, man? Not much, man. How you doing? Thanks for having me. Oh, my pleasure. So we've we've done this once before. We, we kind of did the intro to HPLC with, with, with Jordan Jacobs, uh, one of your neighbors over there in Portland. And uh, now we're, uh, you know, we're going to evolve this conversation. That was almost a year ago or about a year ago. There are more players. There are more HPLC testing labs. There's more going on. There's more cups. There's, you know, just the, 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 the blue rush is, is burgeoning. It's growing. It's getting bigger. And so you guys, you know, I think probably have a lot more to talk about now. So, so we're going to do that. We're going to, we're running through the intros on all you guys, and then we're going to get you together and we'll round table. And by the end, everybody should have a, even better, more evolved understanding of HPLC, why we're doing it, what it's for, what it's not for, some some cautionary tales, some pitfalls, all that good stuff. So why don't you do this? Tell everybody who you are, you know, your 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 background, 
uh, what you did before you you founded Flourish Labs, why you founded Flourish Labs, all that good stuff. Get us up to you run and flourish. Uh, yeah, George Selhorn, uh, PhD in plant biochemistry from Washington State University in 2006. Uh, about 17, 18 years of biopharmaceutical drug discovery, uh, mostly working with protein uh, drug targets. I've worked in HIV, uh, vaccine uh, discovery. Um, I've worked in uh, multiple sclerosis, a few different cancers, breast cancer, uh, children's leukemia, um, other inflammatory diseases like uh, multiple sclerosis. Maybe I said that already. Um, and then I also did some work with children's leukemia where we did uh, bioconjugates for, uh, in order to try to replace a frontline therapy drug that has a massive amount of uh, anaphylactic shock associated with it. And then I've also been the director of environmental and cannabis testing lab for a little while. And um, another uh, biopharma job working with protein drug candidates. And then um, in I guess it would have been 2021. I had a couple of friends say, hey, you should start a cannabis testing lab. I think I told this story on the previous one, so I won't go into detail. But, you know, I basically had an experience early on in the cannabis days where someone was like, you should start a testing lab. And uh, I didn't, um, although I was really interested in it at the time, but I just finished my PhD. So I was doing all the HIV work that I was interested in, and, and I didn't. And so I kind of regretted it. And then when a couple of friends were like, hey, mushroom lab, I was like, yeah, let's do it. So I had recently sold a house before that. So we had some cash to invest into the equipment and the space and not have to have any partners. So I did that. And uh, January 1st, 2022, the lab opened. And uh, so we just had our two year anniversary and things are going great. Um, have a lot more testing under my belt since the last time we talked and uh, the lab has expanded significantly into functional mushrooms and some other um, uh, testing uh, products that people were uh, asking for. Um, things have been going great. You know, there's been times when I've been way too busy and, and wanting to hire someone. So I, I finally did hire some help uh, to help me with sample prep and some things like that. So there's not a one man show anymore. Um, and hopefully we can keep going and expand the lab, get some more scientists and just, uh, you know, keep, keep riding this, this wave. Keep it going. I love it. Okay. So, so you're doing all the tryptamines, you're, you're doing all the, the panels everybody's doing for, for cubes and, and other actives, but now you're also doing cortisepin testing. You're doing, um, so what other functional mushrooms have you been developing, uh, protocols around testing for yeah right um so um just to cover all of the psychedelic tests that we do uh so we do psilocin psilocybin uh nor psilocin biocystin and nor biocystin uh for the tryptamine alkaloids and we can do uh extracts biomass edibles you do gummies chocolates candies we have protocols for all those um, i also can do dmt testing so 5-meo or uh, uh, nn DMT, and that's usually, it's more of a purity test. It's only one, one analyte, it's just how pure is your sample. Uh, I can do MDMA, also a purity test. Um, that one's been a little tricky for edibles because I've been getting uh, some pretty low recoveries, but for the straight up uh, uh, sample, like a pure, pure or a, a, a relatively pure DMT or uh, MDMA, we can do that. Also do mescaline. And uh, I just finished developing a Kratom test, which I haven't even advertised yet. So I'm going to be doing that. Um, and then so the functional side of things has actually been super fun and exciting. I've been, uh, it's been a pretty significant portion of the business. Oh, Ammonita also on the other side of uh, uh, the psychedelics. I think that rounds it out. You did some testing for me. That was uh, definitely valuable information. So um, yeah, that, that was cool to get that. But so now functional mushrooms, they're, they're, oh, they're gaining steam, man. I'll tell you. So, uh, the, the biggest seller right now in the functional space is the cordyceps test. Uh, it tests a lot of cordyceps. It's great. I really love it. Uh, it's, uh, people send me some of the most amazing fruits. It's, and, and everybody sends so much. I so, they're so generous. I'm like, just send me a few grams and people send like a half ounce, you know? 
And uh, so I got to see a lot of really cool cordyceps fruits and people are doing cordyceps extracts and stuff like that as well. I haven't seen any edibles or anything. I don't see the point of that really for, for that particular one. You just powder it and put it in a drink. It's great. Um, and then also chaga, I can do, uh, in chaga, I can do inotidiol. This is an anti-cancer compound that is not a very popular test, but it is out there. I've done it a few times, but it's going to be there waiting for people to use it because, uh, um, once people actually, you know, you know, something I've done really poorly, um, with flourish is advertise, especially on the functional space. There's not really any barriers, but I've just, it's bandwidth thing for me and a cost thing. You know, I didn't really want to put too much money towards marketing right now. And then, so the, we also have, uh, recently put in a reishi test so I can do four ganoderic acids. It's gano, ganoderic acid, A, B, D, and H. And uh, I think that will be a really popular test when people find out about it um, because uh, those compounds are pretty remarkable, those ganoderic acids. Um, and then also we do beta glucan testing. And uh, that's uh, another really, that's probably the second most popular uh, test for the functionals is beta glucans. Um, and I recently, uh, so there's, I've tested extracts and uh, biomass for the beta glucans. and. Um, it turns out that there's an alternate sample prep type for the beta glucan extracts. And so um, that was pretty eye opening to me. And sure enough, you contact these companies, they're like, oh, yeah, there's an alternate. Oh, I'm like, oh, maybe you guys should put that in the IFU, you know, instructions for use. Um, so I think that covers it for the functionals. My holy grail is the lion's mane stuff. Um, so I've been, one of my side projects is trying to work on getting like making standards um it's been slow going so far but uh, i have some friends that grow a copious amounts of lion's mane and i also have another friend slash uh business associate um i don't want to say too much here but he's got the technology to probably not probably to at least isolate you know the compound groups of hersonones and uh, uh aranaceans whether it be from the uh biomass or the mycelium and he also has this other machine that he's unique and he can separate the mycelium from the brain okay it, it should be said that uh one of the reasons that you're interested in probably working with people to isolate standards is because currently there are one or two standards available and they are astoundingly expensive exactly like several thousand dollars a mig yes we're talking five thousand dollars a bottle so for a milligram for yes for virtually nothing for a test so there's i mean a tremendous amount of work to be done there because there's a reason they're not available my my hypothesis is that uh they're not very stable and you try to purify them out that yeah so you got to try to find a way to stabilize them in solution although you know there's lots of companies out there that figure out how to get things stable and, and really the you might just have to isolate it and then lyophilize it to dryness you know and then store it at like minus 80 and stuff like that but you know I'm, I'm right near ohsu and uh there's some opportunity there to work with them like they have a pay facility where i can pay to have the the fractions identified by nmr and that sort of thing and then you know they have equipment like lyophilizers and freeze dryers and stuff like that you can uh you know it's like a paid for them to do r d for you a little bit so I'm, I, I might use that avenue as well so there's lots of opportunities, just time and money mostly. Yeah. Now, what I think is interesting about that is no one's doing it, right? It's it's the most popular functional mushroom. It has the most anecdotal and most research around its benefits. And yet, boy, it's hard to, you, you know, you got to be right. It's got to be an unstable molecule because they, I mean, what? Lots of very closely related compounds, the aranacines, like A through, I mean, H or J, you know, there's like a dozen of each one or something, and they're very, <laughs> yeah. Well, that's why there's like Aranacin, Aranacin A is the one that you can buy from like Toronto Research for several thousand dollars. But I'm also thinking about more of a qualitative test where it's like develop a a LCMS protocol that doesn't really fractionate all of them individually, but you could be like, oh, you have one percent total aranacines by dry weight or something like that you know so that that might 
that's probably going to be the first thing that happens before there's a quantitative test. Well, that's very cool. It's cool to hear that um, because, of course, we love talking about magic mushrooms. We love talking about cubes on the show. But, right, we are just one component of this much larger movement, which is a general interest in the medicinal value of all mushrooms. So, yeah, to, to hear your business is echoing that idea is very cool because you 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 don't just want people going well there's one mushroom that we really care about and then we don't care about all the rest it's great to hear that there are many many mushrooms that 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 hold promise and that people are getting behind and trying to develop products around so that's very cool definitely believe strongly in the efficacy of these organisms to help us out you know and and uh one of my personal passions is human fitness and longevity and uh, you know trying to be a healthy happy vigorous person later into my years and uh, so that kind of all goes along with all this like I got interested in the psychedelic stuff for multiple reasons of course with the therapeutic benefits but then there's also things coming out about you know psychedelics that we didn't even know which makes it even more exciting in terms of benefits to human health and then you go start looking at the functional mushrooms you know, there's a blurry line there, functional slash medicinal, right? They're all kind of one and the same um, because it's just not, uh, there's no line drawn in the sand of what's medicinal and functional. You know, it's mostly like legal, non-legal is really the, the buckets that we really have. Yeah, in, in nature, they're all just a bunch of mushrooms. It's It's us who have sequestered, you know, psilocybin containing mushrooms into this this dark room in the corner. Yeah, and we don't have to look very far for huge amounts of evidence of how well they work. Just look at the ancient, uh, you know, uh, Eastern cultures. And... Been around for a long time, long, long time. And I, I personally feel like we just lost it in, in the, uh, you know, 50s, 60s, 70s. There was just uh, an interest in squashing that exposure to those things. It, it, it opened your mind. It allowed you to think more freely. And there was a lot of fear mongering going on back then. And so we've been 50 years dry spell, not researching this stuff as medicine, modern medicine has, I mean, you know, working in, in pharmaceutical vaccine research, pathology research, all that stuff. I mean, from the 1980s on the accelerated rate upon which we have developed new medicine. Things move so fast now. And, and, psychedelic research has been non-existent during that entire evolution and now throw in ai and just think about how much faster it's going to go because most of the biotech companies these days are are working with ai already of course yeah because they're all that's just looking for patterns so yeah it's perfect when you have these huge especially now that we have all this molecular data you know it's not going to take ai programming the machine learning side of things for for biopharma is, is it's unbelievable. I mean, I, the last company I worked at before where I'm at right now, um, which uh, I don't know, I think I got sidetracked on that. So uh, they was full on, they're using AI to develop drugs and try to test and see if they work. I mean, I remember seeing a Vice News where they said, well, we finally modeled this receptor site. And so now we, we ran the math and there's 34,000 potential proteins that could, could, could bind to this. How do you figure out which ones to start with? Yeah. And that's the conundrum that we've been in forever. Once, once we got like molecular tools and genetic tools to, and like, uh, it became a game of numbers. It's like, we can have access to all this information, but how can you physically test that in the lab? It's, you know, when I, that HIV vaccine work I did, um, that was before AI, but there was a lot of uh, computational stuff that drove the candidates that we made. And so it was actually my job to make those every single one of those protein vaccine candidates and then purify them and put them into that small animal models and then get that the sera back and characterize the sera. So like I was the one that had to like push every one of those through the lab and it was a team of us of like four people the 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 protein subunit vaccine 
group that we were, uh, uh, I was actually ahead of. It was crazy, dude. So you think about those thousands that are there in five years, we probably did about 150. Right. And, and that was a monumental amount of work. A huge, like yeah. a whole team of actually yeah. more. It was like, we would make the protein vaccine candidate. We'd send it off to another lab. They would put it in the animals. They would send us the serum back. And then we would do some of that house work in-house in our lab. And we'd send some of that out to collaborators on the oh, grant man. to do other, dude, it was insane. It was like yeah. a $20 million Gates grant too. It was wild. Such a wow. cool experience. That is cool. And, and you know, most of us common folk, non-scientists, we just don't know how much work goes into this stuff. Mm -hmm. We just, the only story we know is, didn't a guy like find penicillin on like a rotting banana? And, and then <laughs> like, these are, these are the stories we get fed, right? Yeah. We, we don't have any comprehension of just how much exhaustive work goes into this stuff. I know my, my favorite thing is like hearing the media go, um, well, they discovered blah, blah, blah. And I'm just like, man, do you have any idea what that they discovered encompassed? You know, it's, it's just cool to think about. But... Oh, they were just walking through the woods and they found a box and the answer was in the box, right? Yeah. Like, yes, exactly. It's simple. Like a lifetime of work gets simplified into he discovered. A paper, yeah. Crazy papers. Yeah. All right, man. Well, this is great. Uh, everybody, uh, I, I hope, is ready to to round table. So we're going to get done with all the intros, and we'll bring everybody back, and and we're going to start asking some questions, get you guys chopping it up, and and try to see where we're at with things. Sounds good. Thanks again. Appreciate it. All Looking right. Forward to it. All right. Welcome to the show, Caleb King of Triptomics. What's up, man? Hey, what's up? How you doing, Michael Geeky? Thanks for having me here. I, I'm having fun in my basement as usual. If I'm not growing mushrooms or harvesting mushrooms or playing with my microscope, I'm about to sell my Nikon Eclipse. Uh, it's great, but man, the trinocular heads on those things are like 1500 bucks used. So I, I bought a Modic. I'm, I'm going to be geared up. I'm going to get to do all sorts of fun things with it. I can't wait. So just the start. Just yeah, we're just we're, we're gearing up. We're, we're trying to do all this fun stuff over here in my basement. Want to want to emphasize my washer and dryer is right over there. Anyway, no judgment. All the best labs in the world, including ours, started in a garage. So you know, it ha you got to start somewhere. You have to. And in my case, it's in the very back corner of my basement. All right. Anyway, so let's let's do this. So I've I've met your business partner. Uh, I met him in Mexico. And let me just tell you right now, I totally get why you hired this guy. That's that's a bright guy. That is a passionate guy. He's bright. He's smart. He thinks outside of the box. It was apparent within minutes of talking to him. So, but but I don't know you. So let's uh, and, and we're gonna roundtable later. But for right now, tell me who you are, what your background is, and uh, why you're doing this triptomics thing. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you got to meet Chris down in Mexico and be on the Oaxaca trip where um, basically taking a look at the genetic diversity of psilocybe and, and other mushrooms down in Mexico. It sounded like it was an incredible trip. I wish I could have made it. But, you know, Chris and I met um, probably about five years ago um, based in the cannabis industry in California, working for one of the first um, testing labs in the nation. And I quickly saw I'm, I'm on the chemistry side of things. I'm an analytical chemist. I quickly saw that, you know, Chris's capabilities and, and molecular biology, um, uh, bioinformatics, just it, it was it was a perfect marriage of two complementary skills, because as we go forward in this world and, and understanding different sciences and especially natural products research, it's the combination of different types of sciences coming together. It's the math, the mathematicians, it's, you know, the biologists, it's the chemists. Everyone comes together because it's a system. And mushrooms operate the same way as a system. So tryptomics is focused on the system. Um, and we like to call it kind of a metabolomics approach. Uh, metabolomics being, I like to consider metabolomics kind of being looking back in history. What did the organism produce? What was the compounds that it made? And then how you go about um, doing that can be how you go about understanding the pathways that created those um, compounds or those metabolites is the study then of genomics and transcriptomics um, as well as, you know, analytical chemistry. So Chris obviously takes on a certain, a very large aspect of how can these organisms produce it using their genetic codes. I'm focused on, all right, they have the genetic code. What did they make or why didn't they make it? 
Um, so Tryptomics focuses on that, and we provide testing services to the community in general, um, harm reductions testing services, as well as exploratory research all the time. So you guys can just get down with some good old fashioned. Here, here's a mushroom. Tell me how much of X, Y, and Z is in it. But you can also do some pretty higher level, like, all right, we're trying to, we think we want to develop this natural product. We don't know what's in it. We don't know what it actually does. So you guys can do the analytics on it. Chris can tie in, you, you know, the, the DNA, the genetic piece of that, as well as going beyond that and, and getting to publishable research, um, having a product then that has like some science behind it, which is pretty important. Absolutely. And you really need that. It's, it's not only just the primary research, you know, that's important to this. A lot of these natural products, um, a lot of our current medicines today, are, they're derived from natural products. Um, and they continue to evolve from natural products. We want to understand how can we have organisms produce more or less, in some cases, of these natural products, not through kind of, you know, um, breeding as in terms of genetic manipulation. That's not what our focus is. We're focused on how can you naturally get the organisms through their own evolutionary pathways to make these compounds specific for human health. Um, and then how does that interact with your genetics? That's kind of our long-term vision as a company is heading into pharmacogenomics where we will understand how your biology is impacted by these different compounds present in these plants and fungi. I can tell you right now, everybody that watches my show, that's that's truly at the core what they're really all about. They They like how this stuff messes with their stuff for sure. So that's that's very cool. Now do this for me. So we're, tonight when we round table with everybody, we're, we're definitely going to be primarily looking at psychedelic, magic mushroom, cubensis, other actives, right? We're going to be talking a lot about psilocybin, psilocin, but what all can you, so let's say, because you just said natural products. So let's say I grow cordyceps. Can you tell me how much cordycepin I got in my cordyceps? Can you tell me like... Walk me through the broader picture what um, what protocols you have in place for different functional mushrooms that are that are the talk of the town these days. Yeah, absolutely. It's we see all kinds of samples come in through our lab, and really, it's from in cultivators out there, um, breeding individuals, product manufacturers, um, researchers, of course, everyone that kind of wants to know what, what is the chemical components of what they have. And so we're able to do either what's called untargeted metabolomics, where we're kind of looking at the whole spectra of compounds, the whole suite of compounds that can be produced, um, or we do what's called targeted metabolomics. And that's the primary part of our business right now is testing for people's um, active ingredients, the, the common active ingredients. For example, you said cordyceps. We test for cordycepin, adenosine, tryptophan, things that are naturally present in um, like cordyceps mushrooms, Look, expanding into lion's mane here. Um, obviously, you said the psilocybe side of things is what we're going to focus on tonight. And we've kind of, our name comes from tryptomics, you know, being the tryptamine molecule. So anything tryptamine is, has been a focus of us. And that tryptamine molecule really makes up the backbone of a tryptamine, makes up a lot of what we analyze as a lab on the targeted metabolomics side. Um, so we also look at DMT compounds that are present. The beta carbolines that are present in either mushrooms or known as ayahuasca. There tends to be a lot of beta carbolines present. Um, these classes of compounds we've we've started to chase after and are approaching well over 150 compounds in our library. That's that's more than I thought you were going to say. Um, now I got a question. So let me say I came at you with a mushroom. You're like, oh, I don't know about that mushroom. And Cayman doesn't know about that mushroom. Cerulean doesn't know about that mushroom. What would be the process? I'm just curious because I, I think you're the right guy to ask this. What would be the process if I said, you know, anecdotally, I hear that some tribe somewhere uses this. It could be a root. It could be a mushroom, whatever, some natural product. Are you guys set up where you can take that and say, we can tell you what's in it. We might be able to figure out, you know, what the the active compounds that are having some of these pharmacological effects might be. Can you guys do something that big picture, like beyond just stuff that already has standards, that's already been published? Is that something that you guys want to be doing? Is that something you're doing? Is that not necessarily on the on the table? No, at, it, totally on the table. It is 
the exploratory side of, of more of what we're capable of doing. Um, basically, that utilizes uh, mass spectrometry of um, liquid chromatography, mass spectrometry, or gas chromatography, mass spectrometry. And so for anything that's not scheduled, um, so it can't be psilocybe, unfortunately, at this moment, or any other kinds of comp um, compounds that may be considered schedule one in the United States, we're able, though, for any other organism to be able to tap in and look at all of the components present. So, you know, what is what are the major compound classes that are present? What are actually some of the specific compounds that are present? And to be able to tell you kind of a list. Quantification of that becomes a little more challenging because you do need a standard or you need something to reference it to. But at least saying this is in here or no, this is not in here um, are definitely projects we take on. And those are part of bigger, longer term projects that we, we have with some individuals. So basically, um, in layman's terms, right, if I give you a box of cereal, you can give me the ingredients list. You just might not for some of these compounds, be able to tell me how much of it is necessarily in there. You can't quantify it. For some of those compounds, like I said, if they're in our list of 150, you know, compounds that we currently do quantitate for, we can do that. But um, <laughs> nature makes a lot of compounds. <laughs> a lot of chemistry go is going on out there every single day. And really, it, you know, I would say, I think most chemists that have come across only 400,000 of these compounds. So it, it's just still scratching the surface. Of what's possible and I, I know only so um yes we can kind of tell you what is there but can't give you a percent necessarily for those bigger projects that you're talking about well that's still very cool all right so now so for most of the people watching um you know there have been a lot of these psilocybin cups is is what they get called and people get their precious fruits that they think is very you know the 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 term of the day is spicy everybody likes to talk about how spicy their mushrooms are and so they enter a cup, they get to find out how spicy their mushroom is. You guys are able to do that, but then you can also do a, a much broader uh, tryptamine profile. You could also test for adulterants, right? So like if if somebody, let's say I'm a, I'm a head shop and, and I want to start selling a chocolate bar, but I want to make sure I'm not screwing my, my customers over, I could pay you guys a couple bucks and you guys could tell me, yep, there's mushrooms in here, or nope, this actually is a synthetic derivative. That is that kind of in the ballpark of also things that you guys do. Yeah, we've definitely explored that um, a little bit is, is into what synthetic um, things can be added to these products. We did a study in California that we'll talk about tonight in the, the cast with everyone is that we found, you know, quite a bit of products that are in head shops and stuff currently labeled as mushroom containing really are not mushroom containing. And, and so we've been able to tell you how much um, of some of the synthetics are in there. In some cases, it is more of just a yes, it's in there, but we can't tell you how much. So we've had a few cases of that um, specifically pertaining to the Amanita class of compounds, um, Amanita muscaria, that being the ibotenic acid and, and muscimol. Um, we've seen things such as ketamine and um, amphetamines and other things that are in this muscimol isolate that came over from another country. And so being able to tell people at least, hey, we can't tell you what the compound is, but we can give you the class of compounds that are in there or, or specific you know, class, then I think that at least gives people some education because that's really what we're after is to provide that harm reduction service to folks out there that just don't know and, and are unassumingly thinking that they're buying what they're, they're getting what they're buying. And that's not always the case, unfortunately. I think this is, this is worth saying. You could, you could be hired by a grower to figure out the potency of, of a, a strain they really like. You could also be hired by a head shop. You could be hired by an end user who says, you know, I'm, thinking I, I, I want to use this person as, uh, you know, where, where I get my microdosis from or, or something like that. But I'm a very cautious person. I got a few bucks and I would like you to test it first. Have you ever had somebody do that? I'm curious. Yep. That, that is definitely an important component of what we provide is, is giving people personalized kind of information back. And I'll, as I mentioned, I think at the start of this, you know, the grand scheme of, our, of what, we, what we have going on at Tryptomics is understanding what these organisms are producing and how it inter inter interfaces with your body. Um, and so that is what we're coining as personalized natural medicine. And if, if a synthetic is right for you, in some cases, folks are just fine with synthetic versions. And that 
I don't want to discourage people from using that. I'm not on one side or the other in this necessarily. It's that it should be at least transparent to the customer that is buying something and the customer deserves honesty from the producer that's making it. On the flip side of that, the producers need to be checking batches. They need to be understanding what's the variability in their dosing that they're putting into these products. Um, and so we, we offer that service as well as really helping to formulate and give custom formulations for folks. I love that. That's great. All right, man. Well, this is going to be fun. Um, we're, we're, we, we've brought a, a few people together and you guys are going to, we're going to talk shop. We're, we're, we're going to see the current state of HPLC in, in, in this space. And I think it's going to be a good time. Let's do it. All right, man. Let's do it. All right, guys. Uh, welcome to the show. We got, here we go. We're, we're going Brady Bunch this one. All right. Top right. We got Ian Bollinger. Bottom left. We got George Selhorn. Bottom right, we got Caleb King. Um, okay, so Ian uh, used to run Hyphae Labs, did all the HPLC for Hyphae Labs. He is now independent. George Selhorn is doing, uh, he's rocking Flourish Labs in Portland, Oregon. Caleb King is doing, uh, where are you guys? Denver, right? We are in Longmont, Colorado. Longmont, Longmont. Okay, Longmont, Colorado, my bad. All right, so we got, just so for people who don't know, these are definitely, in my opinion, three of the heavy hitters. They were early to the game. They, right, the, right, they were country before country was cool. That before this was a whole fad, they showed their love and commitment to psychedelic research and wanted to provide quality HPLC. Um, so we're going to get into it tonight. We we've done the the HPLC 101. We did that with George. And uh, Jordan Jacobs, uh, not quite a year ago. I think it actually has been now pretty close to a year ago. Um, so for anybody that still says, wait, what's, H what's HPLC? We're going to link that that episode. You can watch that in the description. Tonight, we're going to get into it. We're, we're getting nitty gritty. We're talking about where we're at in the mushroom community right now, what, the, what these guys are up to, how they're working, what they're figuring out, all that good stuff. So how about this? Who wants to start off? Just just break it down real simple. Give me a lowdown. Why should anybody be doing HPLC right now? If you're growing mushrooms, right? Why do HPLC? Who wants to hit that one? I'll I'll take the first answer at this question. And uh, it's two words, harm reduction. Um, at bare minimum, knowing how to dose appropriately is key, specifically not just in product making, but consumer use. Yeah, and I would just say you don't know what you have, whether, and that's not only on the harm reduction side, but you just don't know the chemistry of what you have. Somebody may tell you that, that, that there is a specific comp, uh, group of compounds that are in there, or it's at a specific potency, um, but just like I think many consumers of cannabis might know, uh, it's not, there's batch to batch variability, there's sample variability, there's genetic variability, and you just don't know what you have in your specific grow room or grow tent until you test it. And sometimes you have all three of those. All the more reason. Yeah, no, that's funny you say that. So I had sourced some Amanita muscaria from a guy in Estonia over by Russia. And, you know, he's selling me up and down. This is quality, quality, quality. I have been keen to, you know, check it out. A lot of people talking about therapeutic benefits of Amanita muscaria. You know, what's Muscomol going to do for me? I sent both some local Gasawi variants that I found here locally in Ohio and uh, some of that uh, Estonia sample to George, and he tested it. Guess how much Muscomol was in my, my Russian Amanitas? Nada, not detectable, not there at all, nothing in it. My Gasawi locally, still very, very low amounts. So that was lesson 101 for me of, oh, just because you read a little encyclopedia blurb that says there's muscomol in there. Not always. So, yes, I love that. So harm reduction and then got to actually know what's in your stuff. You really do. And then also for producers, uh, you know, it's really important for them to track their purification process and their product development so they know how much to charge. I've actually had a couple customers, despite me encouraging them to batch test things like their biomass and then their extraction and then their edibles, 
you know, they'll go through this thing. And I actually had one customer who's been with me for almost a whole two years. Just recently, he was really frustrated and literally told me he thought I should move my decimal point because he was losing so much. And I was like, I don't think so. I mean, I. What's the scientific technique for that? What is that called? Oh, yeah, that's called lack of ethics. It's called dry lapping. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was like, because he was just so shocked that the amount of biomass he was processing and then the amount he was getting out, I was like, well, you're losing a ton somewhere. You have to figure out where that's at so that that doesn't happen. I love what you're saying, George, because the point of product making is to make something that is has a bunch of different factors to it, preferably safe and human consumable. And that requires you to know a little bit of chemistry to ensure that you are doing a full spectrum or getting everything out that you would like to get out in a both safe and human consumable way. And I'll touch on that a little bit later when I discuss some of the things that Center for Microanalytics is trying to teach at an entry level. Yeah, I totally agree with that. And also, you know, from the business person's perspective, do you want to spend five dollars per unit or 50 cents per unit to make it you know and if you're throwing a bunch down the drain then you're just increasing your per item product cost and that's not sustainable right and you bring up an interesting point of you could be buying your socks lid or whatever fancy methodology you're using sonification for extraction only to have the data tell you yeah that might not be the way to go that might not be getting netting you the result. Like you think you're doing something fancier and you're you think it's it's all helping you out. It might be more complicated chemistry occurring during that process that isn't helping you maintain those compounds. I would say, or better yet, having an understanding of chemistry can help you to create better products. Yeah, yeah it's it's surprising how many people that are doing this sort of work. Um, not surprising that they don't have any chemistry background, but that they don't make an effort to get a little bit of an education on it to help them with their efforts. Because this stuff's frustrating, man. And even for people like us that have been doing this our whole lives and been in, went through school and, you know, there's no hard and fast rules here, especially when you're this early in the development of a industry, of an industry, you know, it's a, a lot of lessons to be learned. There's a lot of techs out there. There's a lot of, you know, online forums and, and things, which are great starting places for people to take a look at what's been done, what's been tried, maybe see what their initial results are. But again, the, the whole purpose of the scientific method is to test it multiple times and confirm. And, you know, forums, to be honest, are not always tested multiple times. Some, some are, but the majority of them here, especially at the beginning of such a nascent industry and and these new compounds we're seeing, there hasn't been replicated testing. And that's I, and that's what I love coming together, all of us as a group, as scientists and discussing, hey, what are you finding? What are you finding? And let's see if we can replicate it. If not, let's figure out why not. That part. Like that. Yeah. yeah. So, okay. So right now, you guys can all test for all the common tryptamine alkaloids. That, that we find all, all the, the psilocybin, the psilocin, the biocystin, the norbiocystins. Now, I know George had mentioned to me there was a new panel or a new column. I think maybe it was a column product, something like that. Yeah, it's, it's not super new, but <clears throat> it's relatively new. And uh, uh, you go ahead. Sorry, I didn't interrupt you. Yeah. So just the idea of so what can you with regards to psilocybin containing mushrooms, what all compounds do you guys have standards for? What are you testing for? Let's talk a little bit about where we're at with what you guys are doing. What can you really find out is in your mushrooms or is in your product? I would love to start here because I think what I will say will inform why I would like to start here. Um, so, while working at Hyphae Labs, we had one methodology, but while developing the Center for Mycoanalytics, which is the intro classes that we have been teaching both in Oakland and plan on teaching in Detroit, um, our goal is to focus on entry-level compounds for specifically educational purposes. I could, getting a whole panel of the eight tryptamines to a person that's never seen a chromatogram before, it's just gonna confuse the heck out of them. Um, and so focusing on psilocybin and psilocin for 
psilocybin containing mushrooms as an educational point is the goal of the Center for Mycoanalytics method. Um, furthermore, in that same method, we also look at adenosine and cordycepin if people do not choose to want to work with um, uh, entheogenic mushrooms, if they want to use cordyceps instead. So that's the base level space that Center for Mycoanalytics' goal is to help people learn how to get an understanding of how these things work for. So then you could do work with a larger company, George, Caleb, to get the more nuanced perspectives involved there. So that's kind of why I wanted to step in here first. Nice. I mostly uh, pick my analytes based on demand. So uh, I went with psilocin, psilocybin, and then norpsilocin, baocystin, and norbaocystin. I haven't had too many people ask for originacin or any of the other ones, so I just haven't invested into them. But uh, if they did, I would. But you know, those are the big five that I get asked about mostly. I, I would actually like, I know hyphae before they have the beta carbolines and stuff too. I, I think those are super interesting to look at as well. Yeah, um, we had 18. I think compounds uh, at the time that I left the company. And that being said, I think Caleb can pick up from here. Yeah. So um, we started off with the basic, you know, compounds, the the, the five, I guess you call the big five right now, it, um, the norcilicin, uh, psilocybin, psilocin, and as Sin kind of wanted to expand that, um, we run a pretty long method at Triptomics, more of a research and development method. Um, we found that to get some of the separation needed, and I'm sure we'll talk about this more in the discussion, but to get some of the separation of compounds on our HPLC system and really spread out and get some good clarity on what's present, um, you know, it, we found many, many peaks were present and starting to just go through and, and look at the UV spectra, look at how they absorb, you know, UV light and say, okay, what class of compounds is this? And then from there, you know, looking in the literature, seeing, okay, this class of compound could be present. Let's go buy some standards for it. Let's see if this truly is that, you know, compound of interest. And so we've spread into over 24 compounds now in mushrooms um, and other entheogens and are trying to expand that all the time. Um, we are, we consider ourselves kind of a tryptomics, a uh, metabolomics company. So we're really after what is everything that's present. So when are you buying your mask back? <laughs> Who wants to give me a mass spec? Yeah, talk? that's a, <laughs> hey, anybody out there, any like filthy rich land developer or real estate mogul, you know, there is an opportunity here. You would be doing the Lord's work for sure. I am a mass spec guy through and through, and it's it, it breaks my heart every day to see HPLC, but it's what we have. And, and yeah. it is still a huge contribution, I think, to the community in terms of what yes. Ian said, harm reduction. And so let's start there. And absolutely, if people are ready to advance and, and explore further, we're down for it. Yeah, so uh, now I, how I've about been, uh, waiting on a way to get a LCMS as well? A couple projects just sitting there, just staring at me, going, "Come on, man, <laughs> yeah. do it." Um. So how about this? How about going off of the theme of uh, safety? Just like how to, you know, first and foremost, this is gonna net safer products. How about the adulterants? Are you are do you have panels that are testing for synthetic? You, you, you know, syn synthetic cheats, right? Like somebody's juicing up their product or somebody's saying this is a, you know, a mushroom chocolate bar, but there's actually really no mushrooms in it. Yeah, I've uh, I've seen quite a few uh, with 4ACO and I even have people making 4ACO products on purpose. You know, it's just both sides of the coin. But if you're going to tell someone what's in it, that's a different story. But there's definitely, you know, people knocking off uh like polka dot has a lot of imitations that will people will grab their their artwork make bars with four aco and then sell it on the street for like a dollar cheaper than the ones they're selling in the shops and stuff like that and uh, 4oh less common i had one situation where someone brought me some gummies and they're like these things are super potent we want to know what's in it i look for psilocin psilocybin uh muscimol uh 4aco 4oh I, I got nothing and people are saying they were getting super high and uh and then like i ended up finding out that the person was claiming it was ammonita the person who made it because the person who had to test it bought them and they were like i want to know what's in here it's super potent i was like i can't i don't know it's a research chemical or something that i don't am not aware of um another thing that's super interesting i don't know how, how far along people are with this i don't know if ian or uh um uh, Caleb, if you've seen this either, but I've had a couple people claim that they've made some novel uh, psilocin conjugates 
with like sugars and stuff like that. So they're going to migrate on the LC way differently. It's like a, you'd never be able to detect it really not never, but, you know, you'd have to do a very extensive detailed uh, investigation. Like Caleb's talking about like R and D type testing, um, which is very expensive to try to nail down what's in there. And that, that is, I don't know if scary is the right word, but it's super unethical, you know, uh, and they're just trying to get around the legality stuff. But what they don't really understand is that we, the United States passed something called the Analog Act. So anything that you conjugate it to, it's still going to be an analog because it has that structure attached to it. So it doesn't get around any of the legal stuff that these people think they're doing. They could be spending tons of money. And if somebody like gets hurt or something and then they the, the, the feds go down and chase that, they're going to get in trouble, you know? So... It's a lot of misunderstanding here, the legality stuff. Remember when I said earlier about making products has a couple of questions, and the first of which should be like safety and then like human consumption? Um, there's other layers that you build on your business. Um, to your point, George, legality is one of those in some instances. Um, and the thing that I also think about when it comes to these conjugates that people are putting together are stability um one of the big things with any of the hydroxytryptamines the the silosin like compounds so that's gonna be like norcilosin or as jordan likes to call it not for hydroxytryptamine but dinorcilosin um uh, as well as uh, four hydroxy trimethyltryptamine which there isn't a fun name for i've got my own one i'm not going to drop it here but i've got my own fun name for it as well uh, but the idea is those four hydroxy compounds are not as stable as their phosphorylated counterparts. Furthermore, the four acetoxy counterparts as well, like uh, psilocetin or four um, acetoxy dimethyltryptamine. Yeah, because if yeah, you yeah. see, and, sorry, go ahead, just real quick. No, uh, the, yeah, yeah. I've had people make those four ACO gummies or something, and then I test it for like a few weeks, and you'll see the conversion over to psilocin. You know? Yep. And I'll, I just want to add here too, we did recently, that uh, we had a customer come to us and, and wanted to really do a deep dive on what was being released in um, some of the smoke shops in the Bay Area and in California because they were they had, had a bad experience. And so um, we said, sure, you know, be glad to happy to test it. And so that ranged from the chocolate bars, the polka dot chocolate bars, which maybe were knockoffs. You know, we didn't go out and buy them, so I can't say who exactly made them, but we had, had a range of products out there um, come through and were tested with us. And I, I want to say that out of the over 20 of them, there was at least eight to 10 of them that had four acetoxy DMT in it, which is, I know it says DMT, but it's it's basically psil uh, psilocetin, like uh, Ian was saying, and breaks down into psilocin once it hits your stomach. All of that is fine. If people want to, my opinion is if people want to have that in the product and they advertise it as thus, that it is containing this, go for it and, and do it properly. But yeah, and that was the challenge is these packages said that they either contained amanita or they contained actual mushroom fruiting bodies. Right. It was just false. And that is yep. false advertising. Yeah. Yep. Well, in America, we never do that, right? <laughs> but Snake oil, it, what? That means something, right? All natural, those those mean something. It's I mean, where'd they get this these ideas to like trick people? I don't even know where they get that from. <laughs> Such a foreign concept here. I mean, now, so it is interesting to hear this at the end of the day, right? I, I, I've seen these graphs of all the different tryptamine alkaloids. And as not a chemist, uh, I've taken a cut. I, I got through two organic chemistries to to do what I do in healthcare. But, and, oh, yeah, they're rough, guys. I, I really respect, I respect. Uh, for someone that wasn't going to become a chemist, it, it was a lot. That was my favorite class. But, man, dude, that's Obviously. just like Japanese, man. <laughs> In one ear, out the other. If you don't use it, like man, I used to knew all the alcohol. Nihongo <laughs> Gone, 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 gone. Oh, got those that was vitamins. my favorite class, but that was like twenty years ago. So I, I, mean, I used to be able to like look at a compound and you know give the IUPAC yeah. name, but no way could I do that stuff anymore. <laughs> yeah. So all I know is it seems like these tryptamines are kind of a spectrum that that they can move around depending upon what's being acted upon, different chemical processes. And from what I'm hearing is psilocin, psilocin, however you say it, 
is potato, seems potato. to be like a, a stable ish version of that. So you have these synthetics. It seems to it, it hits the gut, and you're saying it, it wants to turn, it wants to dephosphorylate and, and become psilocin. Psilocybin. Yes, I thought you said psilocin. I just want to make sure that that's clear. Psilocybin, the pho four phosphoryl oxy dimethyltryptamine, is the phosphorylated versions are the stabler compounds. Um, and for acetoxy is more stable than psilocin, psilocin. Um, however, um, it's important to note that there are unique chemical properties of both the acetoxy group as it is being processed by your body and the phosphate group as it is being processed by your body. And then furthermore, um, talking about aruginacin, um, and 4-hydroxytrimethyltryptamine compared to psilocybin and, and psilocin, aruginacin does not cross the blood-brain barrier. Thus, it binds differently to serotonergic and other uh, sometimes dopaminergic receptors. There was a paper that I believe came out at the end of 2023, um, no, sorry, 2022, um, that looked at specifically the cellular receptor binding profiles, a, a bunch of different ones of all of these psilocybin and psilocetin analogs. So psilocybin doesn't bind to receptors, but psilocetin does. And that makes it have a totally different effect because if psilocybin doesn't necessarily have a physiological known effect, it has to be converted to psilocin first, but psilocetin does have an effect, and then when converted, it also has an effect. Those are, again, two different experiences you should be aware of going in. Yeah, and it makes perfect sense as a biochemist because the phosphate is a big, large, sterically hindered molecule. It's not going to bind to the receptor. That acyl group is small enough to fit in there, but it's going to not bind the same as the, the psilocin, you know, and then they're going to turn on the receptors at different affinities and stuff like that. And modulation it's really interesting i think i saw this paper and it, it had a huge chart of like bonding affinity for all the yeah i, I saw and this there, we we talked to i talked to dr rick about about this paper it was very interesting i mean right right we're talking about what's in your stuff and then there's a whole nother world of and what is the stuff doing once it's in exactly, your body yeah so That's i got a really a really good analogy here because uh, when I was in graduate school, you know, going on 18 years coming up uh, when I graduated, we knew a certain amount about G protein coupled receptors and how they regulate different things, right? Well, last year I went to this uh, uh, con conference and I met this uh, professor at Stanford, and he was, his research was on G protein coupled receptors, and he talked about like six or seven additional binding sites that they've discovered in the last 20 years that modulate that way. Like it's not just on or off. It's like tunable. And so yeah, I'm wondering. That's what we were talking about. Yes. A lot that of receptors it, it, are it, like that. It conforms like different things. Yeah. It, it modulates. You might have a a solid, and, yeah. Yeah. A hundred things solid can hit that binding site, but each thing changes that protein structure and, and then, then the way it's yes and yeah. it drives different protein pro protein interactions with the receptor yes. and so there's a very good chance that the receptors that uh we are interested in could be modulated in a very subtle way by some of these other alkaloids that we don't know what they do you know so we're in such an early stage here that that you know based on what i've learned in my previous lives as a scientist and the more resources that have been, and guess how all that information came about with the legalization of cannabis because cannabis functions through G protein coupled receptors. All those resources went in and we've learned all this amazing stuff just by <laughs> decriminalizing cannabis. So maybe we'll learn about the same kind of stuff with mushrooms. And now that we have that experience with cannabis behind us, we can, you know, facilitate this stuff and learn even quicker in the mushroom space. Hope I like that. All right, so let's, we, I love that this was great. I love it when we get so into something, I'm completely off my notes. Oh, I could talk good. for another 20 minutes off notes, but I feel you, I think we yeah. should stick to the notes. Yes. They're good notes. Yes. All right, so how about this? Let's get into um, sample prep. I think this is, uh, man, I, yeah, I could stay where we're at right now for a while. I like all this, but let, let's talk. I know a lot of my audience, right? 
they grow mushrooms. They're growing it for themselves for wellness. Maybe they're cultivators uh, on a more serious level. And they're they're entering these these cups, right? They they wanna see how their prize cultagen fares against everybody else's in, in the prize for potency. Let's talk about sample prep. I I know uh, it's an issue, and if everybody is not s preparing their samples that they're sending to you in the same way, that has a big outcome on results. So whoever wants to talk about that, I know Ian has done these cups, so he's yeah, he's got the most experiences. Let's let's him start off. I'd love to hear his perspective. He's seen this evolve over over the years here so far. Um, I believe. In, and this is my stance, and it might be a hot take. I believe in testing a sample as it's delivered because I think that's representative of the way you're going to receive it from the person. Um, don't get me wrong. There is value in understanding moisture content, percent dryness. However, comma, there's no standardized methodology, as you've said. Like there are people chomping at the bit just to understand what temperature do, how do I dry my product to preserve it the best? Um, it's in questions like that. And I think that there is space to provide some insight, but I think the insight's pretty much exactly what you would anticipate to hear. Um, but that being said, testing products as is is my goal. Like I don't, I I believe that getting information about a product, like its moisture, is important, but don't not testing that sample, if that makes sense. Like drying a sample further or pre-drying a sample before testing, I don't necessarily believe in as a practice because I think that at that point, I'm not talking about with the consumer who is the person I'm trying to talk to with most of my cups. I'm not trying to talk to the person that has 400 bags in their room. I'm trying to talk to the person that just got a, 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 a three and a half grams an ounce or something like that for their friends for a trip. So whatever they're getting is the thing that I want to make sure we're providing data on. And that's my perspective on that. Uh, same here, I do it the same way. I test it as is and I dehydrate a separate piece of the sample so that I can test as is and then dehydrate and adjust for water. Now, how often are you finding it's not adequately dry? Me, almost never. Almost everybody's comes pretty darn dry. Yeah. Okay. Let's also not forget where you're at. <laughs> <laughs> True. <laughs> The, there's the occasional sample that'll come up to our lab that, that you know, is like, ooh, this is a, a tad bit on the moist side. So I, I can't say it doesn't happen, but the majority, even in Colorado, I would, just like George said, they come pretty much ready to go dry, cracker dry. A lot right, of people so, send them with desiccant, too. That's really useful. Okay, so desiccant pack. Not uncommon. Dry. Not uncommon. All right, so why do you think, because I, I heard that there was quite a bit of time at the um, Altitude Consulting did a, a, a cup in Denver. And they spent at the awards ceremony, I guess, a fair amount of time talking about sample prep, almost as if they felt that there was still a problem there. So if, if you guys are getting dry samples with desiccant packs, almost never, you know, uh, moist, where do you think the work still lies in uh, receiving a, a quality sample? Like what's going wrong? I think there needs to be representation so again, if my goal is to be speaking to the consumer person eating three and a half to five grams, then that should be the sample mass I'm testing. If somebody just wants to hand me a hundred milligrams of a sample and expect me to test it, it's like a hundred milligrams in some fruits isn't even the cap. And so how can that be representative of the whole flush? I've done work looking at uh, uh, the potency of different mushrooms in different places within a single bin and seen variants. And so there's something to be said about representative re representative sampling is I think the first thing, it's like making sure everybody is submitting something that is of that. Cause I mean, somebody sends me a, a, a five gram fruit, which has, ha I've, I've seen 15 gram fruits, you know, and it's like, I can test the whole thing and I'm gonna test in replicates that's which is also helps me to get a little bit better understanding of what the range of that 
sample whatever submitted is um i think that those are good starting points that are allow for reproducibility again that's as caleb said the scientific method the goal is reproducibility which is why uh, the Hyphae Cup reached out to Triptomics to try to parallelize analysis for the cup that we did in uh, 2022. That's the big goal is to be able to create reproducible or at least within tolerance of 5% ranges of data because that's what we would expect to see within a sample or better. I like that. Now, what I really like is this idea of, okay, cool. So let's say I need... I don't know, whatever a uh, standard sample size for one of these cups is. What is I'd say like three and a half to five grams. Again, like what a person might consume in a sitting. I, I like is what that. I would argue. It's what I would argue. Well, even even if they only required, let's say they required half a gram. Okay. If I'm if I'm selling to somebody who's gonna consume, let's say two to four or two to five grams, it would make sense for me to either send in that much and let you then homogenate or I homogenate and send in a representative sample, like you're saying. That's an interesting point. I don't, I've never really thought about it from that perspective. I think if I was going to send something in, I would probably look for my craziest looking fruit, the one I, I wanted to put, you know, all my chips on and find the, the juiciest part of it and send you that, that little chunk. But like you're saying, the end game, I, I might be able to be playing some game for myself into, you know, winning a cup, but it doesn't translate then to, is it representative of what somebody experiencing my, my fruit is going to have? It might be close, it might be way off. There's a couple things with that component there. So sending in the juiciest fruit or the best looking one, it's that's bag appeal. Let's be honest. That that's that's how it looks. That's how great it looks. And there is a category for that. They're, they're, those things do matter to, to people and that's fine. But when it comes to analyzing the data and wanting to get data, what is representative of the entire lot of mushrooms that you've grown, you really need to actually grind up everything and send in the powder. Like that, you, the, the, the person making the products should really grind everything to a full powder before sending it into the lab. That way, if they don't like the lab's result or they question it or potentially, they can send that powder, homogenized powder, off to somebody else and have them analyze that exact same sample. Otherwise, you're creating sampling bias. And that is... That's a, that's a non-stop game of, of, of error that I'm, I'm sure George and Ian both have encountered where people are like, oh, no, this lab over here tested and it was this high and this lab over here tested and it was this low. And it's like, were we, were we comparing apples to apples or were we apples to oranges here? I've only had one customer do that where they grind up stuff and send multiples of the exact same samples to uh, a couple few different labs. Is that, uh, you know who that is. Kiki, uh, that Plum guy, Plum on IG, like about a year and a half ago, he had me and oh, Jordan fresh, and fresh, Rose Scotty. Fresh Air Exchange. Fresh Air Exchange, yeah. yeah, yeah. Man, those guys were so thorough. They spent a ton of coin on three different labs, and uh, it was really cool of them to do that. I yeah, I think it was pretty... four labs, but, four but labs, yeah, yeah, they they were the first to do something akin to a proficiency test, mm -hmm. like on their mm -hmm. own, obviously not, a, not an accredited proficiency test center right. but they i talked to them quite a bit they they did a really good job of uh of planning and executing it in my opinion yeah there, there's another similar study going on right now with the psychedelic standards organization um here in colorado where they're sending it off to a number of different labs as well and as well and so get ready for another release of data comparing different labs and, and how they analyze the homogenized powder that came to them but that's the key starting point right there it has to be the same sample material Otherwise, you're creating sampling bias, and that does nobody any justice when it's trying to figure out what the true value is. I have a study example that I think fits in nicely here. I had a customer um, basically take a pound, homogenize it, um, randomly sample it like uh, the way you would in a, in a cannabis, like you have five pounds, you know how you take from different parts. So they did that, vacuum sealed all the individual packets, and then stored everything at 60 degrees in the dark. And we tested, you know, day zero, the first time they sent me one, we tested a week, a month, three months, six months, and a year. Um, vacuum sealed in the dark, 60 degrees F, zero statistical change over a whole year. Yeah. Completely flat potency. Could I ask what kind of statistics you did? Did you just do ANOVA? 
did you yeah, do? Yeah, it's just a simple t-test, you know. But I mean, okay. the variability between the numbers was minuscule. Was so like, you're I, actually, I, I just like to ask. Yeah. Oh no, so for sure. Yeah. You're uh, talking about a, a a big bag of homogenated ground up mushrooms, mm -hmm. and when you say f you sampled from like regions within the bag. Yeah, different so areas and depths. And yeah. then took enough of those from their different regions and depths individually and kept, sealed. kept rechecking it at those intervals mm -hmm. and you had you had shelf life stability mm -hmm. as homogenated powder i was shocked to be honest interesting i can replicate that to, or i can add to that that we include with every single batch of samples a laboratory quality control sample which is a very finely ground homogenized um pound basically of material and we've just been dipping into it for the last two years because we only take a small amount for the analysis and there has been a slow downward trend i would say but it, it is minuscule it is it, it is relatively constant especially when stored under the right conditions store it if you're willing to show um, we store this one in the freezer just for just straight up frozen. like a, a regular freezer a regular freezer we have started to shift most all of our samples though to a negative 80 um freezer okay. just to further increase that stability nice. there's there's been a study i saw in the past that have come out and I, I can't say that anyone has replicated where they saw actually the most significant change in psilocybin potency at minus 80 and and that mm -hmm. just that, that i can't we have not replicated yeah i have a problem with that that's the that's the one within within the, the stability community. of psilocybin in this analogs paper that that i have quoted i will state because it's published but at the same time i know of the data of what caleb speaks yeah, so there's a chart that that talks about even temperature, right? And a lot of people mm -hmm. use it to justify what temperature you should be uh, air drying your your fruit at, and and it's you know a slow decline until uh, it gets very hot, very mm -hmm. like hotter than any dehydrator could ever get, and then you see a steep drop off. And yeah, they say the same thing about you know don't freeze it, don't freeze it. But if you look at their graphs, right? Like I only took one statistics class. But if you look at the way the scale is set up, it's not set up right. It's set up to, you know, they, a statistician can make the data say whatever they want. It, it made it look more significant than it was. Right. To Caleb's point, if it was represented equally and properly, it would almost look like a straight line. The, so they basically just zoomed in on the y-axis. People yes. do that. Or they'll yeah. zoom out. People do to that. Try to try to highlight, data. yes, mm -hmm. to highlight a trend. Sure, the trend is, of course, it degrades over time. But that's fascinating to hear that just good old fashioned, because, man, I'm not going to lie. I store all my fruit whole, you know, cherished whole. I, I, I vacuum, too. I vacuum yeah. seal the, the jars. And only right before I'm making my, my microdoses am I going to grind them up. But it's fascinating sure. to hear, maybe I'm freaking out over nothing. That's probably totally sufficient because when you have your mushroom intact with very yeah. little damage to the biomass, it's not going to degrade very quickly, especially if it's in the dark and cool and vacuum sealed. Yeah. And but it's good to know that, that I can grind it up and I'm not going to lose. I mean, mm -hmm. that's great to hear you guys say that. The key, the key thing that affects potency is that we have seen in our lab is water. Water yeah, is that the part. biggest thing that will mess with your yep. potency values because there is an enzyme that is present in the mushroom yeah. naturally called um, Psy-K, and it takes yeah. that version of psilocybin, the phosphorylated tryptamine, and converts it to psilocin. And, and it only really does that in the presence of water. When it's all dried out, it, it can't be an active enzyme. But as soon as you just add even just some really humid air around it, you start having that degradation process begin. The clock begins. Yeah. Interesting. And then furthermore, if I may piggyback off of that as well, um, if you've ever, one of the one of the big aha moments baked into the Center for Mycoanalytics um, HPLC uh, mushroom extraction course is we do a same mushroom extracted with water, methanol, and ethanol. So you can see side by side what that looks like going through the process and look at how each one of those analytes come out at the end. So it's like, oh, if I'm doing analysis, I want to get everything out. But if I also, in, in almost all papers, I think have pretty much settled on a methanol-based extraction to get everything out. Almost every paper out there that's published right now centers around that. However, comma, 
if you're making a product for human consumption, it's illegal to use methanol. <laughs> so it's one of those, okay, well, then what's the next best thing? Um, and most people that have ever made uh, mushroom tea and accidentally let it sit out a little long notices the darkening pigmentation that you see. Uh, to further what Caleb's saying, in the presence of water, you have conversion of psilocybin into psilocin, a, a kind of like a pre-digestion, if you will. Um, but you also have activation of other enzymes, Psy-L, which is a lacase, like lacquer, kind of like plastic that you put on or, you know, what you do to a, a shelf or something like that. Lacquer is a polymer of the psilocin molecules that is also activated in the presence of water. So that bluing that you see is likely the locking away of psilocin in a way that it can't be used as potency anymore. So right. you, and it you will don't show up your, in analysis. You don't want your blue juice to turn blue. It, it, it's indicative of something that was right. potent. Right. Was <laughs> tense. Yes. Right. <laughs> So, so that's interesting. So let's talk about that. So instead, let's forget about methanol. Let's just go ethanol water. I, okay. I've had a couple people tell me, don't even bother with the ethanol for, for what we're doing with this stuff. We're trying to get the therapeutic benefits or the, you know, psychedelic benefits of, uh, of psilocin in our bodies. Water's good enough. Have you guys compared, like, how much more are you eking out with either doing a dual extraction or doing water versus ethanol? Well, water's a great solvent to pull the alkaloids out, but like they said, it just, if you're using water, you're in a race to the de degradation of your compounds, which is why people use acidified water, because once you get down below a certain pH, then you're inactivating the enzymes and you can use water. But still, water's full of oxygen, and that oxygen, in my opinion, is the second biggest enemy for degradation of the alkaloids. So, you know. So, if and I'm going to use it right away, if, oh, great. But if I it's may, not a storage. Exactly. Okay. And but and even furthermore, like I'd said, so water we call it the universal solvent. It's both acid and base. It's a, it, it's neutral. It could go both ways, if you will. Um, and because of that, making it acidified also, just like I said earlier, and Caleb had pointed out, there's a pre-digestion of the psilocybin into psilocin. Acidifying your your the lemon tech, the whole point of lemon tech is to do a pre-digestion to do that conversion of the the dephosphorylation step. So, and and understanding that, and I think there's something to be said about what we should be reporting in. And I have a whole rant about that that I'll save if we have time. All right. So, you know, it, if, for example, I'm harvesting fruit, I got a bunch of aborts or I cut off some some bottoms or whatever, and I want to do a quick water extraction because I, I want my, you know, I want to have a good time Friday night or something like that. Water works. Long term. If you're doing it Friday doesn't. night, right. I wouldn't Long tell you to do it Thursday night. <laughs> right. Long term water doesn't work, though. It, there's it's just the water's the enemy so you gotta use it or lose it i like that now so water you guys all agree water number one enemy to potency number two one, enemy of, one of the biggest ones yeah 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 definitely is is oxygen number two i think all of us are hesitant because we don't know for sure right like yeah we have these observations but none of us have the data to to solidly say yes but I think right. for the most the part, non, the, the non-scientist statement. Let's go for the the just the, the hypothetical, person, the hypothetical, the best guess. The I love I love asking scientists to guess. This is my favorite. <laughs> and I'll always preface it's a hypothesis. You know that that's what we're, based on the data we currently have. Which water, I think all of us agree because we have data on it. We've done it. We've tried it and been like, this is not the way to go if we're trying to give back potency results that are meaningful to people. Um, it, heat is another big one in there too. Um, so I, it, whether that competes with oxygen is number two, I don't know. But heat is another big one. I want to say. Oh, and light would be my other one. Yeah. Like uh, specifically we, degradation, because again, dephosphorylation can occur uh, strictly from sunlight. Mm -hmm. And then you you add two together, and it might be synergistic. You never know, right? So it's like, yeah. just try to eliminate as many of them as possible. All right, so I think that's a perfect segue into if you're dehydrating fruit, 
what temperature are you dehydrating at to to preserve active compounds? I've never it, grown mushrooms, so I don't have any idea. It's a lot of right. Idea. Hypothetically, you're hypothetically growing mushrooms. How would you be drying them? based on what you've observed. I'd probably treat it like cannabis, about 70 degrees, 65 to 70 degrees, 50% humidity or so, and just maybe a little drier. Uh, okay. But that's a wild guess based on uh, being a grower for a long time. <laughs> I'm, I'm a big fan of lyophilization. I've seen some very interesting data on that. And again, it hasn't been necessarily replicated as much as I would like, but the data that I've seen so far from somebody who really took the fruit immediately into a lyophilizer which lyophilization is the process of sublimating water out of um, taking it right out of the, the mushrooms themselves and turning it into a gas form. Um, that, that's been some really interesting data, preserving the original material, the original compounds that you kind of want to hand off then or make into a product. And that to answer the question of temperature in that regard, I will give the number for you, Caleb, because that's exactly what I was going to say too. Um, about negative 30 to negative 60 C. All right, so I got That's a question about that. Now, so freeze drying makes a lot of sense. If water's the enemy, that's just getting rid of water the quickest possible freaking way. Um, mm -hmm. Have you done any long-term studies? Like how does freeze-dried fruit store long-term? Have you stored a freeze-dried fruit sample, tested it every three months for a year? Like is it as shelf-stable as just powdered air dried fruit i'm curious about that i can't speak to that point okay from from what i've seen so we had in our, our original qc powder that we started you know and like i said at the beginning of this talk is is we have with every single batch of samples that we run we run not only quality control checks in terms of like spiked standards or spiked unknowns um, but we also include a laboratory quality control which is a bulk homogenized powder that we take a little bit out of and run. And so the very first kind of QC power, quality control powder we had was done under dried conditions, like normal air dried, you know, dehydrator conditions. The second round of QC powder we started to work with is was lyophilized. And really, again, the same trend has been observed where it's relatively constant. It, it's not like one or the other was necessarily there. It just turned matters of what the moisture content that was left in the mushrooms at the term of storage. So that must mean that both of these, and it turns out the data is that our one QC powder has a moisture content or a moisture weight of less than 2%, and so does the lyophilized powder less than 2%. Once the fruits dry, they probably behave pretty much the same, but if you're gonna get into, uh, again, like we were talking about earlier, <clears throat> the most efficient and trying to preserve your potency, then ideally you wanna get that water out as fast as possible. And there's probably, a difference in the if you could have identical cloned fruits that are the same potency and you all right you just do this uh you would dehydrate one normal and do one freeze dry and i would i bet you'd probably see a little bit of degradation of alkaloids in the slow dried one compared to the fast dried one that is logical but I, again you have to have someone do it side by side and how do you have two fruits you can that are yeah. wet and identical to dry out you know so but, you know, there's probably ways around that and figuring out uh, uh, whether or not one is better than the other. But well, if you, have enough, there, if you have enough samples, you could, yeah. statistically, you could increase your probability. But enough data points, that? yeah. Yeah, who's yeah. going to do that? Like a thousand tests, and then you go, yeah, we're pretty confident now. There's people out there. Yeah, it's just whether or not it hits yeah. public. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Now, so, okay, let's, let's get into... Um, Let's specifically talk about anything that you guys have done as far as extraction goes. A lot, a lot of, a lot of talk about extractions. I've been trying to get somebody on talk about extractions for a while now. Uh, it's been a little bit of cat and mouse, but, but a lot of people are interested in this because a lot of people are realizing who wants to eat a mushroom. Nobody wants to eat a dried mushroom. They want to eat a chocolate bar. They want to eat a gummy. They want to eat a pixie stick. They, you know, they, they want a, a funner end product or they they want a chocolate bar that breaks off into their microdose something like that and the biomass makes some people nauseous yeah and and the chitin it doesn't sit well with a lot of people especially right. heroic doses so do, have you guys done any testing for clients as far as extraction methodology is it as stable when you extract it 
if you take it out of its matrix and you isolate it through whatever means, is it harder to maintain shelf stability with a, a purely extracted product? Depends on what matrix it's in and how it's stored. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If it's like pure compound, like pure silosin, going to degrade fast. You know, if you get to that point, like if you get to the pure powder, pure psilocybin, if you put it in an amber vial, it'll probably be stable on a shelf for a, a significant amount of time. Most of the extracts I was seeing when I was testing at um, uh, Hyphae were very much brown sugar like powders or um, waxy substances. But I've also observed as of late um, products coming out that look like the early days of cannabis shatter. I've seen so many different sample types. It's, I had no idea mushroom extract could be so diverse. I've seen things, like you said, from like people calling it the goo, and it's just this gooey thing that you have to, it's a pain in the ass. And then there's drier ones, like you said, there's full on like, uh, if you had like a, a, ro a cannabis rosin that's kind of hard at room temperature, I've seen them like that. But I have one customer that is doing some really amazing stuff. He is um, washing his extracts and then homogenizing them, and they're this really fine powder. And they're some of the most potent extracts I've seen. So there's some people out there doing some interesting stuff. Uh, but most of the people are early in their um, journey of figuring out how to do this in a uh, sustainable way because a lot of these extracts that come with any moisture in them they're just going to degrade and i would just add to that that you know i'm sure these guys have seen maybe something different if it's a true mushroom extract that's come in it looks very much similar to like the early days of cannabis where it was something that that was not refined necessarily in terms of color or potency wise um, the max potency I've seen on a true mushroom extract that's been really tried to be lyophilized and purified and everything was topping out around six, seven percent. That's been the highest I've seen come through our laboratory, um, and we did you know well over fifty to a hundred of them. So it's it, it's it's a tough bar to set. The majority, on average, I would say, sit closer to actually like two, three percent. That's what I'm seeing mostly. And that's going through either water and ethanol extraction, reduce it down freeze dry it and then test that's the sample you're talking about different types of people are producing things differently while i'm not privy to speak to specific methodologies i can point to specific people who are leading the pack um i think that there are in the sense of uh like producing things that are i've not seen before it's like i don't know exactly what they're doing but they have a skill set i mean most of them are cannabis extractors these are the people that have been like making diamonds for years and now they're learning how to approach these newer compounds which are smaller and yeah, have their own it. yeah their own uniqueness to them interesting and at the end of the day i'm sitting back here going all right so all that for three percent versus you know what's what's the end game here i'm i i've tested not a three percent biomass yeah right mm-hmm Mm -hmm. I so, feel like uh, that's that's a game worth playing right there. No extra work, no fancy chemistry. Like, yes. And we talk a lot. So I just started a Facebook group and we're talking a lot about, man, a lot of these cultivators are trying to make them look pretty, right? Like Caleb said, they're, they're going for a bag appeal. It's not as sexy to go, I want to start testing this stuff for potency and how do you know you can't just look at these things? So you got to do a lot of HPLC testing. You got to be rigorous. You have to be methodical. And most people are going anecdotal on this one. They're just, you know, they're maybe testing it here and there. And there's also a, a kind of a conundrum here because, you know, most people, they think of bag appeal. I want a big, beautiful mushroom. Well, we're finding out that when these mushrooms are laid down in the button, like almost all of the alkaloids are already there. So as it grows, it becomes less percent dry weight. So there's got to be some size of the mushroom that's ideal, right? I don't know what it is. I believe Caleb did some of some looking into ages. Uh, you guys at Triptomics did a little bit of looking into that. I have my own insights as well, um, specifically about it. But um, furthermore, to, to George's point, there is definitely a point where 
psilocybin or trip alkaloid production ceases at some point between pin and spore drop. Yeah. That it, it just plateaus, but biomass can keep going up. Oh, yeah. Um, I will state when we we're talking about the three percent mushrooms uh, I've seen, they were literally looking like little toes, like little pinky toes, like, and they were so blue they were black, yeah. kind of a thing. I, I'm gonna. Th this is where I, again, I hope replication of, of science comes in. We've explored some genetics though that continue to keep increasing throughout. That I have seen exactly what Ian and and George have described, where the potency doesn't change or it's better when the fruit is small. But we have actually seen fruit that are more potent, potent as they develop along. Um, and then it, it was actually to the point of post-spore sporulation. So the spores have already dropped, and that's when it reached maximum potency. Now, that was not for every single mushroom type variety, but for this specific type of um, variety of uh, penis envy is where we noticed this unique trend. And so it, it, I think there's a genetic component here that you can't just you make a universal blanket statement. To, to go off of that, um, I've grown Casper, and it grows. I mean, it's one of the slowest things I've ever grown, and it is also one of the spiciest. And it is obvious, just in like how I've harvested it, that you think it's done, and it's not done, and it's not done, and it's not done, and it's not done, and you're going on two months, and then all of a sudden it gets crazy, like almost black really mm. really deep blue and i was sitting there going oh that thing was still going i mean it was going that long and, and then you harvest that tub and it's fascinating because you'll you'll cut one and it'll just blue we call it blue on break like almost instantly and then another mushroom that looks almost exactly the same three inches away you'll cut and it won't do that you won't get that de dephosphorylation so i'm like there's no fucking way there's the same amount of active compounds in there I, I i don't buy it and but they're sitting right next to each other in the tub so i think to caleb's point about there being some kind of trigger um there's this hypothesis that i was exposed to when i was doing plant research called the optimal defense hypothesis which goes which says a plant puts its metabolic resources first into these two phases protect my genetics and then reproduce my genetics and it prioritizes reproduction over other things it will lose roots to give the energy it needs to keep its flowers going it will lose leaves to and it will it will sacrifice these things so if we think about my theory was that as sporulation occurs, metabolic energy is being dumped into these other things because we know spores have pigments and things like that. It needs to produce these protective things for that. I could imagine that, as Caleb says, spore drops. There's no metabolic investment in that anymore. It can now sink back into alkaloid trigger. So maybe there's a conversation to be said around um, that. And I really appreciate you sharing that, Caleb, because that's very interesting insight. And to your point about the metabolic metabolic energy um we did some unique you know with the metabolomics work we've done we've looked into the adenosine content and adenosine is part of what makes atp and it's what gives energy to life and so we looked at the at basically this building block to atp and noticed that there was a significant amount of atp or adenosine present right when there was just just as it was kind of a primordial it was a small mushroom that was just getting ready to go and then that decreased over time. So the energy content actually got out lower as it went into sporulation and post sporulation. Of course, there was very little adenosine content. So to like Ian's point, it's getting ready. It's getting charged up. It's getting built up to reproduce and then get ready to die. Think about when we eat a big meal, how all that blood goes to our stomach. You know, it's there's uh, in in nature. This is very common where the organism redirects resources to deal with a certain issue. You guys got my head going now about all this stuff. Cause, cause I'm sitting here just thinking like the other thing. So Caleb said it dies, but if, if I, if I take a little uh, pin or I take a piece of tissue and I put it on a Petri dish, it goes back into mycelium. The fruit becomes the organism again, hyphal growth come off of that. And, and I can even have fruit where if I have a crazy, really really high humidity bag like too high humidity not enough fae 
I mean, the mycelium will grow again right off the top of the caps. I just had I just had a bag. I, I neglect to do that. So that's that goes to what Ian's hypothesis of, you know, it it gets done with the spore drop and then goes, oh, well, let's go back to being mycelium again. And let's go back to doing what we do. I could take a cauliflower floret and recreate a plant from that with just hormones. And so that's something that I think um, mushrooms are unique in the sense that, you know, plant cells can be teased back into different states, vegetative states versus reproductive states. Um, and I have a theory that that's true of mushrooms as well. I mean, everybody that like get their prize fruit, they cut to the middle, they do their transfer and that's their clone. And they do that over and over. That is something that you, you're, it is not dead. However, it is aging. And there is something to be said about like in cannabis, it's like, yeah, you've been cloning this one gener this one plant for 15 generations in, and you wonder why your profiles are different. Um, there's something to be said about low hanging fruit, the low hanging fruit on looking at stability. I mean, heck, there are some LCs that you can get that is out of the LC or out of the spore drop, you're going to get five different varieties, a gold cap, an albino, a blob, all out of the same uh, piece. I mean, out of the same uh, LC or spore print. So I think that there's something to be said for really recognizing genetic stability as something that we're looking for in the future as well. And there's also going back to what Ian said about the two primary directives of the plant, you know, maintain itself and reproduce. Once these things go through a reproductive event, they're like, huh, maybe I'll just start protecting myself again. And they try to regrow or, you know, establish, you know, put out new mycelium for the fungi or, you know, put out some new shoots from the base of the root for a plant, you know. Interesting. When they can't run away, they come up with remarkable ways to survive. I mean, oh, for yeah. all we know, the we think about things separately in plants. Like we look at the, let's say, the potato plant. It's a nightshade. It flowers, but we don't eat the flower. We eat the root tuber, which is vegetative reproduction. So it has two strategies, sexual reproduction and asexual reproduction. Maybe that's what the mushroom is doing too. The fruiting body itself is a tuber-like compound that we're literally taking and cloning just like you get an eye from a potato, but at the same time, it also doubles as a means of sexual reproduction as well. Maybe it's just a genius strategy that we haven't figured out yet. Bro, you, yes. So check this out. I'm I'm trying to cultivate a uh, Salaspi Zapticorum. So I, I, I got a culture going. I did a whole bunch of plate work. Did you I read the publication really... on it? Oh yeah. I, and I was there when Jordan presented it down in Mexico. It's awesome. It's awesome. So, so I'm, I, I get a nice culture going and three months down the road, I get a big, huge in vitro pin. So of course I go, cool. I'm gonna chop that up. I'm gonna put that on another plate. Let's, you know, let's just keep this thing going. Let's see what, what that can do. And now when I take that transfer of in vitro pin tissue, that will fruit off of that tissue in a month, almost, mm -hmm. I mean, Almost to the day, and I know this for a wow. fact now because I've sent this out to other people within a three-day window. I've sent it out, and, and I, I'll message them going, hey, uh, according to my records, you know, this thing should be pinning, and they'll send me a photo. Oh, yeah, bro, it fucking pinned. Here it is. Look, here's the picture. So what you're saying is probably right because now you got you go from the mycelium can pop a pin out in three months for whatever reason, it, it cycles three months. But when I have a little piece of clone tissue, now it's only a month. So now this is this theory for all that degraded tissue. Is that a different mycelium coming off of that? Like you're saying. Well, it's got Cooper the same genetic. It's a, it's a dikaryotic tissue sure. as compared to spores, which are monokaryotic. Sure. So again, we have asexual reproduction in the fruiting body itself right. and sexual reproduction in the spores. Yeah. But man, I don't know. Something, you know, things can happen. This mycelium's complicated. Um I've worked monocultures that that I'm convinced there's just a single dicarion. It'll it'll stay symmetrical and perfect for 14 transfers and then out of nowhere it'll sector. Out of nowhere. Why to do that? I don't know. 
Anyway, I, I hear you. Growth is yeah, cell division. Yeah. Growth is cell division. Yeah. Always remember that. True. I'm I'm with you, but I'm also like I think there might be a whole there might be some other stuff we we, we don't know what's going on. I agree. There's a lot of stuff we don't know. Yes, two two nuclei, two haploid nuclei only sexually reproducing in the basidia. Yes, yes, yes. But man, the mycelium's fascinating. It's just throw my mutation in there for yeah, good medicine, that's right? Like, and, and what are the factors that can increase the odds of that? That's, you know, is chopping a fruit up or, or having a deer trample it and move it five feet in another direction, does that trigger different enzymes? Or a bear activity? chomp it or some stupid monkey. Yes. Well, we know in plants there's a lot of really subtle, highly specific uh, plant microbe and plant insect interactions that yes. trigger things the thing that actually got me interested in going to graduate school and studying plant biochemistry and plant physiology is uh, my last year at indiana university in a plant physiology class and he gave us a paper on one of the very first so this is like 1998 uh one of the very first reports ever of a plant signaling a predatory wasp to come and oh. attack a uh a pathogen insect that was chewing on its leaf and i read that and i was like this is the coolest thing i've ever heard so it's highly probable that that you know fungi can do those sort of complicated interactions with the environment as well i mean paul oh. stamets already told me i already know he already said they're smarter than you know we realize so well, yeah. yeah that mycelium it senses when people or anything walks on it you know yeah. and the experiments they did with reorganizing the subway and Tokyo or whatever Crazy. it was. I mean, that shit just, how do you even begin to wrap your mind around what that thing's doing? Yeah. The thing that I think is uh, the most powerful and the most interesting, uh, specifically when it pertains to plants and fungi, I always think of them as the original biochemists. Like they've been doing this shit far longer than we have. And practically everything we do in biochemistry, we learned to do because oh there's an enzyme that does that well there's got to be a way to do it now so that's kind of the process so like this comp op opium exists so it's like well we should be able to recreate it you know it's like i mean those are the we have a a whole signaling system inside us called the endocannabinoid system because of thc they discovered that because of thc you know yeah. so and then they found out there's endocannabinoids right so, Yes. Oh, oh, don't get me started on this. Uh, I'll just put, I'll do the elevator pitch for this. Screw the stoned ape hypothesis, okay? Let's talk about the truffled vole hypothesis, okay? So oh. post, post dinosaur meteor impact, um, if you can imagine one of the only common ancestors of all mammals was a vole, a, a, a ground oh. nest mole-like creature, and yeah. it ate those things that were available roots truffles truffles are rich in this thing called anandamide which is uh, and the endocannabinoid that we have in our bodies uh, uh, the primary one anandamide yep and the endocannabinoid system is integral to homeostasis it's one of the things that mm -hmm. i argue allows mammals to be able to, to adapt to such many different environments and ecosystems is because of its ability to regulate its internal temperatures in these meaningful the endo, ways the endocannabinoid system is ancient that's what i'm saying yeah, yeah you're mm -hmm. you're ancient. saying and that was like the one surviving land species correct yeah theoretically so, well, and that's well, the most common ancestor yeah. of all mammals yeah. yes yeah. Yes, that is fascinating. And that's by William Padilla Brown. He's the person that proposed that idea, and I just gave it the name. Nice. I and I that. still purport it. Well, now I know why he's on that truffle kick. <laughs> he's trying to get back. He's going He's going way back. Yeah. Primal. I like it. I like Primal. It. I like it. That's really interesting. Yeah, man. I never thought tuber and tubers and truffles were, were going to hit hit the camp conversation tonight but i like it i like it all right so let's do this so now you know you guys are all here you guys are all doing really cool stuff i mean really cool stuff from working with customers trying to think about you know product safety dosing standardization i mean it didn't take me long as just an amateur in this community to go 
wow, dosing, that's, that's the holy grail over here. Like dosing is really the holy grail. That's still the holy grail. Everybody's trying to figure out all these people with money that are trying to do their extractions and figure their shit out. These guys are, they know the holy grail is the dosing. I mean, right? That's the big boy Pfizer FDA game right there is get that dose right. Although lately I've been reading some articles. Maybe they're not getting the dose right all the time, but, but hear me out. There's a whole other argument there. That's a whole, that's a whole nother, that's a whole nother podcast entirely. That part. So, so if we're doing all this stuff, let's get into, now we got a bunch of people doing this game. I'm counting. We got Flourish, Triptomics, Hyphae Labs, Trip Labs, Intro Art Labs, Altitude Consulting, Rose City Labs, Alchemist Labs, Ghost Labs. I mean, we're coming up on almost 10 labs that are very focused on mushroom work. And I'm thinking, I remember a year ago, I was like, cool, I got George and I got uh, Jordan and, and I knew Ian was, was there. I was like, I don't even, I couldn't even figure out how to get a hold of you, man. I was like, okay, we're, we just got to get this done. And then Ian shows up in the, in the, con in the live chat and I'm like, God damn it. How come he's now he's right there, but I couldn't get him to begin <laughs> with. Okay. Anyway. That's so funny. in one year. We're, you know, almost quadrupling, at least tripling the, the amount of, of labs. I, maybe Caleb can talk about this first, um, but let, maybe tell everybody what proficiency testing is, why it's important. Um, Caleb, what, what your, your lab did to just start kind of getting involved in this and why everybody should care about this, why that fresh air exchange guy on Instagram did such a cool thing by kind of doing his own version of this. Let's just kind of get get this concept out for people to understand. Yeah, I appreciate you bringing this up. It's been actually quite a forefront of discussion here, um, not only in Colorado's Natural Medicine Health Act that's coming online. We have been kind of discussing with regulators how to implement proficiency testing and round robin testing, it's called, where essentially other labs kind of send the same sample around. It gets tested by multiple labs. Um, and, and the reason why it's important, let's I, I, maybe some of your um, viewers are familiar with uh, what is called lab shopping or a problem of potency and inflation in the cannabis industry, where what is on the shelf at the dispensary does not match the true potency of the product. And that is because of a couple of reasons, um, sampling bias being one of those. And then two, also laboratories not being fully honest or laboratory method and and or laboratory methodologies not being consistent between different labs, so different protocols. And um, that, that, that raises a problem because the major problem is consumers don't know what the correct answer is, and they're left kind of shrugging their shoulders like, what, what is the true potency? This lab says it's 10% less than the other one over here just down the street. So why is that? And I, I got to really credit the, the, the fungal industry here is, is it's starting to Take those lessons from cannabis and say, all right, how can we do this differently? How can we start evaluating this and come to a standardized you know, methodology or at least some type of general principles that are important for laboratories to put into place so that we don't have a potency runaway and we're just going for the highest potency you know, mushroom out there? Um, for me, I don't like high potency mushrooms. I really am not going for the highest potency mushroom. I want something that is on the lower end that can help me still give me some of that serotonin boost that I want or need, um, but not actually have me trip throughout the day. It's just, that's not what I'm looking for. And I, that's really important that I think everyone out there gets the dose that they're intending to get. Um, so in terms of proficiency testing itself, there is right now Emerald Scientific um, is the only one that's an absolute, they're in conjunction with absolute standards. The only ones that are doing a, ISO um, accredited version of a proficiency test. Uh, as, all, as you guys have mentioned, there's um, the Fresh Air Exchange and then the Psychedelic Standards Organization in Colorado that are doing um, kind of round robin testing or they're sending samples out um, to multiple labs for analysis to see what the value is that they're, they're getting at the range and values. So the two ways of approaching it are, are, are definitely very interesting ways and kind of put a spotlight on laboratory accuracy as well as precision. Um, but in terms of a true proficiency test, it doesn't currently exist. And by true proficiency test, I mean a test that is a psilocybin matrix, so psilocybin cubensis matrix, that has a known amount of compounds added to it and then is sent unknowingly to labs so that they don't know what they're receiving. They don't even know that it is a proficiency test. 
They just know it's a blind sample arriving to their laboratory. That doesn't exist currently. And it really honestly doesn't exist in the cannabis industry either. Most labs know that the proficiency test is coming. They're alerted to it. So they can either fine tune their methods, calibrate real quick and get it right. Um, pull, you know, pull Bill off that machine, guys. Yeah. <laughs> we already know what Bill's here for. I mean, these are real, these are real strategies, man. It's not just a new sort of, uh, you know, maybe have one regulation or no regulate. I mean, I've seen full on FDA labs do this kind of stuff. Oh, yeah. you know what I mean? Where they bring in their uh, hot, the best crew to do this. Yeah, it's it's you know, I, mean, well, shit. I get it. But I work in healthcare, and Jayco comes around, and you know, to make sure everybody is being a you know a good healthcare boy and girl, and it's supposed to be random. We're not supposed to know when they show up. We we know almost to the afternoon when they show up. Yep. It's literally you get an email in the morning. Welcome, Jaco. It's oh, almost okay. like uh, like what they say. For... Yeah, it's yeah. bullshit. And then I mean, I worked at a hospital in Los Angeles where we had this whole we were doing the sash thing for med passes, so you didn't get bugged when you were passing medication and you know reduced uh, med errors stuff like that. And and Jaco loved it like oot and odd over it thought this was the most coolest thing they ever saw and then a week after they were gone i had been off for a week and i came back and i put my sash on and like literally within five minutes one of my uh, co-workers goes what are you wearing that for jaco has gone and i just th sat back going man like nobody fucking gets what the point of this is the whole point of that governing body is to improve the quality of health care are we fucking doing that or are we not doing that? There are so some lessons you cannot teach people. Yeah. <laughs> they can only be learned. Yes. <laughs> so true. Oh, but don't worry. They have a they have a 30 minute uh common sense training that that we go through. We, they, they they believe it's teachable. I don't. I agree. Well, I mean, you're a micro guy. Your audience are micro people. How long did it take you to get your contamination to a reasonable place like you got to learn aseptic technique i can tell you what it means to be clean but the only way yeah. you're gonna get there is by doing it yeah can't talk about it got to be about it yep and all that stuff's not fun yeah uh, or like george was talking to me about you know man if you're every morning you you got to calibrate your shit Every morning, you got to do this to do it the right way. Costs a lot. Of, you're burning through a lot of standards, you know. Yep. To to do it the the sloppy way, you can save some money, you know. You can you can lower your price, but but you're not doing it the right way. So to Caleb's point, standardizing a protocol so that there's at least a bare minimum criteria of what you're doing with your machines, what machines you're using, how they work, what your columns are calibrated for. I mean, all that stuff. It's like, you know, does somebody check your pipetters once a month? Like all yeah. those little things play into errors. It's like when you get your freaking gas at the pump, right? The little standards guy signs off that we've checked the, the gas. You're actually getting a gallon. I promise you, Kiki. Right? Like, yes, that stuff matters. Well, so, that's one of the things that I appreciate being able to stress in the classes we teach at Center for Microanalytics. We discuss what ISO accreditation looks like. It requires precision, accuracy, and then also showing what those mean in the scientific context. Like the first things that we do in the lab, the first thing, calibrate your scale. Literally, like, and that's what we teach the students is you write down in a log what your scale is at right now and where you're at with oh no this is out of spec it needs to be calibrated or oh no this is out of spec we can only trust it up to this significant figure furthermore you could say that there's something to be said for making sure your instruments are repeatable to the big scientific methodology that's part key components you need to prove to the standards organization that you have precision you have accuracy and then even then if you move outside of scope you're no longer under accreditation anymore and it's a very precise thing that is necessary for precision and educating people to the importance of that is something that right. we can do but we can't force them to learn it and, uh... and you can't force them to want it some people like you know George's guy who said how much to move the decimal point. That guy. No, that no, guy. no, that, no, that was 
he didn't say that. I that, that was a different guy that offered oh, okay. to pay me to change my yeah. So oh, that guy, that, that guy. person, that guy. Yeah, 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 that, yeah that guy. So I've had a couple of things like that recently. It's been yeah. pretty, pretty lame. But I want to touch on something that Caleb said earlier, because um, we're talking about standardization, and you know, uh, we buy these standards, certified reference materials, and we use them, but they also are subject to degradation and stuff like that. So Caleb's talking about having this big pool of biomass that it's an intern. Like I doubt he reports that to his customers, but it's an internal control so that they can track over a long period of time, spanning multiple lots of CRM standards, which you can normalize and find all this stuff. It's like how, how it's like a, a second check and balance, you know, and really good labs are going to do that to themselves because then you're not just relying on one source of truth being the CRMs because sometimes they might make a mistake too, right? or very infrequently that's going to happen. But what can happen is if you store your CRMs for periods of time, they can evaporate a little bit and get more concentrated, or you have analyte breakdown, they become less concentrated. So having more than one check. And then also when you do a, like an actual validated assay, you get CRMs from at least two different companies, right? So you're not validating your assay on a single company's CRMs. And I'll add to what George was saying there. The CRM companies, the certified reference material producers, while yes, they are ISO certified um, standardization, they make mistakes too, and they send out batches of, of oh. you know, standards that are incorrect. And I had this happen with a THC, a um, THCA standard, a couple of years ago through one of the big manufacturers, the biggest manufacturer, excuse me. Cerulean. Uh, I, I, I want to name names. Okay. Um, okay. Sure. Well. All right. But. Um, it turned out then seven months down the road that they were releasing lots of THCA standards that were off um, significantly. Now, it was great for the labs then that wanted to report higher values of THCA in the products. Here's the So catch no there. one was complaining. So you're it, saying that happened? No, for a while, no, no, one was no, 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 no. Those guys were not complaining. So the dispensary cells were not complaining. Yeah. It turns out this was during the hemp era boom as well. The oh. hemp guys, of course, are going to complain because they're oh yeah yeah okay and that implies a legal implication to it right so mm -hmm. it is this these guys make mistakes and double checking with different lots of standards like george said different manufacturers of standards as well as having your own internal checks as a lab are all good measures to do and things as consumers should look for when they're saying hey you know how does this lab handle my sample when it comes in just looking for that iso 17025 i, I love iso iso is great i would recommend it of course it's not the only thing that a consumer should be looking for, though. That part. It's not, it's just like you were talking earlier, Geeky, about organic being a label. Right. ISO is very similar. It's, it's, yeah. it, things that are high quality have ISO, typically, but ISO is not a guaranteed sign of high quality. Right. Man, that makes me think, so in the ER, um, a common story for an overdose Let's say take a heroin overdose. It's mm. either um, I couldn't get it from my usual guy, so I got it from a different guy. And whoops, thought I was getting, thought I knew what I was getting, and I didn't. The other one, the worst one, the one I feel terrible about, is when the dealer is getting from a different place, but not telling his buyers that, and he has no clue what he just bought and what he's now selling. And, you know, I keep somebody from dying and they, I mean, they were dead. They came in dead. We, we, we revived them, but it's just, it's exactly what you're saying. You think you're buying from, oh, we're 99.99% pure standards. You know, I'm paying top dollar for the best standards and yet everybody can make mistakes. This is the, the checks and the double checks and George is talking about how Caleb's using another internal control that he can track over time and use that as a gauge against some of these things to see if things get squirrely and look weird. Yeah, I've been doing that too for about a year and a half. This is, this is a level, like the common person, we don't know this. We don't know. We, mm. have to do, we didn't know there were four layers of, of checks mm. and balances and, you know, calibration and you know when when does your standards expire and and you know how what's your open time look like and is it evaporating and all these things that you guys are methodically doing mm -hmm. and taking very seriously being rigorous scientists 
and we're just going how cheap's that test again 100 bucks dude 100 bucks 100 bucks are you kidding me i need to get 40 tests i think a good tip for you know potential customers of ours all of ours is that uh or people out there looking for a lab if you contact a lab and they're not willing to be very open with you about your questions. I mean, obviously they're not going to be calling us like, how do you do your extraction? But if they have questions and they're trying to figure stuff out and the lab is not answering your questions or not like making you feel comfortable about sending in your samples and spending money, try a different lab. I mean, because to me, it's the most important thing that I do is like, I, I go out of my way to, you know, let everybody know. It's like, I'll answer almost any question that you ask. I, I'm not going to, I'm going to hide very little uh, from my customers because I want them to feel, you know, comfortable with what I'm doing and, and trust me. And it's a big thing when you're a scientist, you know, you really, all you have is your ethics and your, your integrity, right? Like yeah. we, the scientist knows if they're fudging stuff or, or cutting corners and things like that. But like, if, you took your career and your science seriously, that shit will eat you alive. Like if I did that and I went home, I wouldn't be able to sleep. I would feel so bad. And I'm not going to do that to myself, I guess, out of selfishness because I want to be happy and, and healthy and not go to bed stressed. But you know, I take this very seriously and I know it's not cheap. And I try to give people the best value that I can. And I would be willing to bet that these two here do the exact same thing. Like Ian said earlier, we are in the business of harm reduction. Yes, we are a business. We all three of us are business people, and and you know that's what we we have a lab to operate. We have overhead. We have to pay. We have people we want to employ. There's ISO organizations. There's standards. Yeah, if we were killing it, we'd all have our, our LCMSs. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> <You know? laughs> if I was rolling in the dough, I would be like you know charging five hundred bucks a test for uh, LCMS stuff. But, uh, you know, One it's day, a grind. Hey, it's a grind. patience, patience. I think get there. the best line I heard, uh, I heard uh, today, I think I was talking with Chris about it and he saw it and it came up in conversation. I think it applies here very much. Um, the price of safety is priceless. Oh, yeah. I make because... a post that on my website. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'll like... quote you. <laughs> I mean, don't quote me. I'm not sure where it came from. It's yeah, probably somebody else's thing. It sounds good enough to be that. However, yeah. it's important to recognize, yeah, I mean, it's like there are some things like when it comes down to, you know, whether or not your friend lives or dies, you know, whether or not you have to, whether or not you have to call an emergency room because a person got something that they didn't test, you know, yeah, like to your point, my geeky, like that's, that's, yeah. that's the idea that you're presenting here. It's like, there are fundamentally important components that we are still in the infancy of and that we have a responsibility to a community if we want to like like george said what if we want to sleep at night we want to be able to say that we're helping people and we're not creating more harm and yeah. that's the biggest thing that scientists i think all the data that we present is not to be like yes it is this all the data that we present is signs all the no's point to this like there's enough no's for us to say is this is this valid well we've calibrated it so we know that this is in this way we know it's precise and it's accurate so we've done the work to figure that out now we can say is this not this well we say that enough times we know what this is right and we're all trying to work towards this understanding of science doesn't provide yeses it just provides a series of no's i like that yes it does like even like a right a hypothesis versus a theory even something yeah. right the theory is as close to a fact as you can get in science this but again it says right now this is what we think we know it's still a theory the theory can evolve the theory can change i, yeah, but, I, I mean think that's 90, a really 99.99 percent .99 of the time when people are like i have a theory i'm like no you have a hypothesis, you have a hypothesis. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yep uh, uh, that was a good cool. One. Okay, guys, that's the big takeaway. We're going to start having hypothesis, hypotheses. We're not going to have theories anymore. We'll let Caleb <laughs> and George and Ian and a SWAT team of other scientists spend their lives coming up with the theories. 
Like if you're a scientist and you can actually come up with a real theory, like a novel theory, like you win Nobel prizes for oh, that. Oh yeah, you get That's like, like a you get big your, deal. You'll get named after you like the Pythagorean theorem. Yes, yeah. it's a big deal. That's a theory. A and, squared plus B squared equals yeah. C squared. Back exactly. to what I said very early on, theories are replicatable. Like they're, they're right. tested by multiple people at different places, unknowingly, knowingly, et cetera. Um, yes. Hypotheses can be tested elsewhere and they can be demonstrated to be replicable. But, you know, theories hold up to a higher level of rigor. And then you have laws that are, you know, even higher than that. So. Right. Yes. All right, guys, we just went back to elementary school. We learned <laughs> about laws and theories and hypotheses. Most importantly, I think I really am glad coming into this. I did not, I wasn't framing this under the umbrella of safety, but man, I love and care about this community. Uh, my This whole podcast for me started because I see in healthcare day in and day out an increasing amount of people with anxiety, depression, PTSD, all sorts of mental health issues, not to mention regular stressors like just increased cortisol levels from being overworked and uh, overburdened and overstimulated and all this stuff. And mm -hmm. psilocybin was doing a lot for my mental health. And I said, I bet there's hundreds, if not hundreds of thousands of people who are going to go, yeah, I want to try this, but I don't want to get it from that guy at the rave or wherever, especially in the age of fentanyl overdoses. I want to grow my own mushrooms. That's that's the whole reason I started this thing was I want to make everybody feel like this is a safe community, know who they can trust, who they can talk to, figure out how to, you know, risk management, you know, a, a assess what they want to get into and and, and give this a try. And you guys are playing an absolutely crucial role in a time when China's making whatever you want, you know, go on Alibaba. They're not just making your flow hoods, guys. You go, yeah. hey, I want psilocybin, but I don't want psilocybin, if you know what I mean. And they'll send you a bottle of something and you can put it in. And, you know, if you're slick with it, that's going to work. But, man, we're here to help you grow mushrooms. We know what's in them. We know we at least know what's in them that you want in them. And these guys uh, are doing the good work to improve product safety for people as this industry gets bigger and grows and legitimizes and destigmatizes and hopefully decriminalizes. And I mean, I, I feel real honored just to talk to you guys. I'm thinking 10 to 20 years when this is just a massive industry and I'm sitting back thinking these were the dudes like early on who said, I know all about this stuff. This is legit. This is real. This is important. I want to be here to provide this service as a scientist. I commend you guys for what you're doing. I know nobody's driving down the road in a Bentley or a Maserati yet. Give it time. You guys deserve it. You'll get there, right? This is the, this is the 21st century. You guys get to be scientists and drive Maseratis. It's it's it will happen one day for you guys. I'd be happy with just the LCMS. Uh, yeah, yeah, I was, I was gonna say. about to say that. I was like, just give me the LCMS. I don't want the Maserati. There you yeah, go. give give me a like a Honda Civic and an LCMS. That's yeah, what I was yeah. thinking. Well, you you probably you probably need a couple Maseratis before you can get the LCMS. But yes, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maserati. It yeah, depends on the Maserati, but that's true. and the LCMS. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Well, I appreciate you, Michael. You, you, thank you for you know giving the platform to talk about this and and bringing data to the to the masses. You know, we get stuck in our little laboratories, and it, it's hard to break out of those molds. So thank you for yeah. taking this time and bringing that to the masses. My pleasure. Uh, I'm just glad you guys could find the time and we could roundtable it. I really wanted to do the roundtable, so it, it was a little bit of effort to pull it together. I'm glad we did it. Now you guys, everybody watching, you guys watch the first episode with George and uh, Jordan. You get to understand kind of functionally what HPLC is on just a basic scientific level. You watch this episode, you now understand why it, why it matters, what these guys are doing. You kind of got a taste of even how it's going to play a role in the future. Like all these guys are saying, right? If, if you don't have a standard for it and you don't know what's in there, you need that big fancy mass spec to see all your peaks and to start figuring out 
all the goodies that we don't even know about. Is there a goodie in there that's playing a role? And we don't even know what it is. Furthermore, I really feel like there's something to be said about equalizing a process that's standard across the board. Like if we're not processing the same sample, like Caleb said, if we're not processing them, processing them in similar ways, like if what if I use a basified water as compared to an acidified water, that's going to have a different psilocybin to psilocin conversion ratio, and that's going to affect the analysis. Um, and I think in the end, we need to be deciding about what form we're we're describing these things to people so they know how to dose themselves in. Like, like I said, psilocybin's not active. Is it worthwhile reporting in, you know, total alkaloids? Is it worthwhile reporting in psilocybin equivalency? Is it worthwhile reporting in psilocin equivalency? Like, there's a whole other podcast to talk about in that. Yeah. And we'll do it. We definitely left a lot of stuff on the table to talk about, I was thinking. So... It's an ongoing conversation, yes. And the the thing is, you guys can talk. I know you guys have completely dumbed all this down, even for me. There's people that it's going to take them a year, and they're going to rewatch these two podcasts 14 times. But I've had people come to me go, man, a year ago, I didn't know what the fuck you were talking about. You were talking about HPLC. You were talking about haploids and monocaryons and dicaryons and, you know— karyogamy and i had no clue and then slowly over time it started clicking i started reading more articles and now i can talk to people at a level in just one year that they couldn't even get into it they didn't have the terminology the concepts so it takes time right Mm. educating people takes time y'all got advanced degrees you know how long how long it takes and how much work it takes but yeah, we're doing the work. This is this is how we get people more educated, making better decisions, running their businesses better, keeping you guys, you know, running through standards. Now I know you want to run through those standards as quick as you can. You don't want them sitting on a shelf. Yes, we got to do some HPLC tests. Well, I would also like to thank Caleb and Ian because uh, I really love being able to talk to people like yourselves and help me sort of get out of my own head and, you know, you guys raise points I don't think about. And it's just, I love it. It's like, uh, you know, it's like, like Caleb says, and we just, we spend so much time in our labs and like focused on these small problems. And then to come out here with a group of people and talk about the big pictures, it's awesome. And uh, I really enjoyed it. Thank you, George. Thank you, Ian. Absolutely, friends. All right, guys, we're going to do it again. We got more to talk about, and you guys are going to figure shit out in the next year. So, I mean, we got to at least do, you know, once a year HPLC check-ins, at least at a minimum. And you guys are going to figure things out, and you're going to DM me and say, guess what I just figured out, and that might have to be talked about. So, yeah, we'll keep doing this. All right, guys, well, thank you so much. I really appreciate you taking the time, and until next time, burn through some standards, figure some shit out. Uh, can't wait to see you guys continue on this journey. It's very exciting. Thank you. All right. Thanks everybody. Love, to, love chatting. All right, guys, that was the first ever HPLC roundtable in this space. I love it. So happy to be able to put that together. Um, it, it was really cool to hear how genuinely, uh, enthusiastic and appreciative everybody was of being able to bring them together and have an powwow and chit chat. It was great. I loved it. Um, now we brought up uh, a guy plum, this guy out of nowhere, all of a sudden on Instagram, I see this post one day that says we did our own proficiency test. We went out to a bunch of uh, HPLC labs and we sent a homogenated sample to everybody. And uh, here's the results. And I was like, who the fuck is this guy? And this is great. And let me find out more. So, um, so he's been referenced a couple times here, uh, but now we're actually going to take a moment. We're going to get to know him. We're going to find out why he did what he did. Talk about what he learned and how that might impact, you know, some decision-making you guys make when, when you're trying to develop a product, bring it to market. You know, a lot of people moved to Denver, a lot of places getting decriminalized right now, left and right. So this is going to be a a topic of interest increasingly more and more as time goes on. So anyway, I'm going to bring on to the show right now, Plum from Fresh Air Exchange. What's up, man? Hey, what's up? Thank you so much for having me, man. Hey, man. 
You're you did it. You you got the you're in the history books now. First guy out of the gate to go, hey, wait a minute. How do we know these people are doing what they say they're doing? I love it. I, I yeah, think it's thank you for recognizing, man, because a lot of the times uh it feels almost like talking to a brick wall. Well, sometimes you are. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I mean, dude, when I'm working at the lab. All I'm doing all day is talking to a brick wall, but, <laughs> right? but yeah. that's okay. That's okay. It's better when it's a real brick wall versus when you're talking to a person and it <laughs> feels like you're talking to a brick wall. So do this. T give people a little bit of background about you, but I, I think what I really want to hear this go around is why the hell did you do this? How did you get the idea? Where did it come from? And then talk talk me through how you reached out to everybody, how you put it all together, um, and, and, and then we'll we'll go from there. All right, cool. So super, super quick background about me. Um, I've been into mushrooms forever. Uh, I've worked with wood lovers since like 2013. And I've worked full time as a Cubensis consultant and doing genetics uh, since like 2017. Um, sorry, if I seem kind of nervous right now, I'm in like a super, super public place and there's like a bunch of people around me. They're, they're going to learn about this too. There you go. <laughs> You got a live audience. You got yeah, a live audience. On the internet, and you got a live way, audience. So. Yeah. yeah, right. <laughs> okay, so yeah. Uh, so I was definitely involved in the cannabis industry, um, in the medical and traditional markets. And uh, it was kind of the same thing um, with testing. Like anybody who, um, you know, wanted to know where the best product was or thought they had the best product uh, was getting involved in potency testing pretty early on. And, um, you know, right away off the bat, you could tell that there, I think there was like two or three labs in town in Oregon where we started and one of them would give you just way higher results. So like, I remember everybody was flocking to them and giving them tons of business, but like to right. the people who were seeking out, you know, if we actually had the best product around, uh, we didn't want to use their lab, um, because, you know their numbers were so inflated. So it didn't matter to us getting a high percentage from them. Um, so, you know, the kind of people in the know uh, just kind of learned that early on. And then, um, you know, fast forward, we, we go into these dispensaries and it's this full blown misinformation like campaign, essentially, uh, where these like uneducated, underqualified bud tenders are using these inflated numbers uh, as not only a sales tactic, which is wrong, but as medical advice, which they're definitely not qualified to do so. And that's just wrong on a lot of different levels. Um, so especially at the prices that they're paying. Uh, so this is an obvious problem. Um, and a lot of the, the Myco people, we talk about like avoiding the problems uh, in recreational cannabis going legal or decriminalizing or whatever you want to call it. Um, but a lot of the micro people can't really identify those problems and actually probably actively contribute to those problems, um, like uh, falsified THC percentages, uh, supporting those brands, companies, whatever. Um, so it was, it's almost like pretty obvious to me. It was, it was almost like, why hasn't anybody done this yet? Um, it wasn't like, why should I do this? It was kind of just like always, you know, why hasn't anybody sent the same sample to all these labs? Um, so, yeah, so I it made, see that. It made sense to you, right? But you're you're like, what is that El Pacino movie where he goes, you can't handle the truth. Most people can't. <laughs> Most people don't want the truth. They go, exactly. oh, wait, they that, don't, place, they... that place is going to give me the biggest numbers? Great. That's yeah, they were getting great business. But uh, yeah. for the people who are really, you know, about it and trying to figure shit out that's not going to cut it and um i noticed it's an even bigger problem with mushrooms because like uh like a a 0 0.02 percent difference um can be a, an entire magnitude of potency higher correct so if yes. the margin of error for testing is an entire percentage or two two percentages <laughs> right uh then um, you don't want your margin of error to be bigger than, than your result. Yeah, but yeah. that's that's also I'm I'm not even sure if that's accurate because we're saying this uh, 
0.2 percentage is a huge difference, but we don't even know if that's accurate because we don't know if the testing was even accurate. So we're set, we're going off of like, oh, this 0.5 that I had was weaker than a 0.7 that I had. But like, we don't even know if that 0.5 and that 0.7 are accurate to begin with. So like, right. we, don't, we basically don't know what the fuck we're talking about. Yep. And, and um, to even begin to know what we're talking about, we got to be doing a lot of HPLC testing. Yeah. And, and even, testing that we trust. Even with the most accurate numbers, uh, they're going to affect each person differently. So right. that's that's what the, the cannabis industry, I should say, but like even like the, the bud tenders who are using this misinformation or even the consumers. Um, it's sorry, I lost my train of thought here. I'm like shuffling around in the back of this car. You're good. Uh, you're good. As long as you're not in the trunk of a car, I'm. I'm I mean, com I'm comfortable. I'm in my own car. We're good. Okay. Good. Um. Yeah. Sorry. I forget where yeah, I was going with that. You're you're talking about the bud tenders, you know, just using inaccurate information callously, recklessly. They don't even care. Giving out medical advice based on numbers that that you know are just known to be inaccurate. Yeah, it's a. It, that is not good. Yeah. It's, a, it's not good. And, and and we're surely every mistake that happened in cannabis, every pitfall, every warning sign, every cautionary tale is probably going to happen in this industry to somebody. To, to, okay. To that's some what I was saying. Um, so yeah. even with those most, the most accurate numbers possible, uh, they're still going to affect each person differently. So even right. if you have, you know for a fact it's 25% THC, or you know for a fact it's 0. 0.5 psilocybin. That's going to affect right. you differently than it's going to affect me right. differently than it's going to affect everybody. So for them to be saying like, oh, this product, this cannabis is has an uplifting effect, a sativa high, you know, or like right. this has a indica sedating effect. Like that's, that's absolutely not true. Um, and with mushrooms, like I said, the the effects that they're saying, like, oh, this one's kind of mellow, this one's not, like, that could be, you know, uh, I'm the you. effects are going to be more detrimental to somebody's day or mood or psyche than getting the wrong dose of cannabis. Like, getting the wrong dose of mushrooms is, is actually, uh, could be more harmful right. um, than healing. Uh, so it's definitely important to get those numbers right, but it's also important to know how those numbers are going to affect everybody differently and to not uh, basically go off of any piece of paper as like, this is a guaranteed effect. I like that. So again, I just want to tell you hats off to you um, for being the one to go. I'm going to put my money where my mouth is. This has to be done. I can't freaking believe it hasn't been done yet. So I guess I got to be the guy to do it. And it was really interesting to see, First off, the the results. Uh, I I got them here. We can pull them up and and talk a little bit. Let's talk about your process for developing, because in, in cannabis and in other analytical sciences, there are like formal, accredited, regulated proficiency centers that that handle this stuff. You sort of created your own. So I think it'd be cool to talk about your rationalization, how how you you, you know put it together, what you did. Let, let's walk through a little bit of that. Yeah. So, so, so. <clears throat> essentially, uh, after one of the other cups that myself and one of my friends were involved with, um, I was visiting him on his couch and I ate some of his caramels, actually. And uh, I was on <laughs> under the effects of the caramels and I was like, just just like, why are these so good? But they test the same, but they're they're different, but better, but the same. You know what I mean? It was just like. Uh, and then we were talking, we were talking about, um, this person had actually won, uh, w the other cup and, um, we were kind of skeptical about the methodology used, um, because they, they required that we provide like five grams and they chose one of the grams of the sample. And, uh, they, they actually posted a photo of each one. So like, you could see that they used like pins from certain people and caps from certain, some of the other people. Um, so it just wasn't really like representative of that phenotype. Um, so we were, it, it, you know, just talking, like I said, not even structuring it as your own thing. Just, oh, if you were, if we were doing it, we would do it like this. If I was going to do it, right. I would do it like this. And I just said that so many times that I had like, I realized I'd come up with my own cup with all these, <laughs> or like data comparison, I guess. Right. 
Um, and I was going to actually try to do it myself, not as a cup. But then I realized very quickly that that much testing is extremely expensive. Yeah. And it's a lot easier to incentivize people with prizes and a winner. Um, and, and then I actually get a, a broader data set too, like a wide range of samples. So it's not just my stuff. So I could have something that's uh, in my grow that's throwing the test off or that's tricking the test or that's, you know, it, any number of things. So it's good to have all yeah. these wild samples, different samples from all over. So we can just really have like a, a broad data set. Um, so it actually ended up working out for a number of reasons. And it was honestly, uh, the results of the first round in 2022 were much better than I expected. I thought, you know, cause I can't remember how much it was, but it was, you know, a couple hundred dollars to enter. Um, and then you have to send me, if you don't know me, uh, however many grams of your sample plus a bunch of money and just hope that I do what I say I'm going to do with it. Right. Um, so you kind of have to like, also, by the way, not... what a, what a great scam. Yeah, I know. Right? <laughs> I mean, dude, I, I'm surprised someone's not gone. I, I'm, I'm surprised sure. you haven't had like 15, like fake accounts trying to copy you going, just send me all your mushrooms <laughs> and $200 <laughs> and I'll do all sorts of things. Right. Right. <laughs> there yeah, was but trust luckily, there. Um, luckily I'm not a scammer and I didn't, um, yeah. adulter any of the right. samples or alter any of the samples. Um, you know, and I tried to do it as even as I could. I tried to do them right. all at the, the same time. Like I waited till I got every sample instead of processing them that, uh, like one by one, right. but they weren't, um, uh, losing potency. Right. Um, so basically what I did was I powdered each sample and then just, or I dehydrated, re-dehydrated everything all at once. Yeah. Um, so they were all as dry as possible. Then I ground them all into a powder individually, uh, vac sealed individual portions of each powder. So it was an identical portion of each, you know, sampled powder right. yeah. and sent them to all the labs, uh, vac sealed individually with desiccant. So it was as, as even as I could get it. Um, because like I said, I'm interested in this. I'm not trying to have any specific... Right. Uh, genetics win so I can sell them. I'm not trying to like push any kind of narrative that way. I just want to actually know because I do a lot of pheno hunting myself and I use these things for my own head. So right. I'm trying to, you know, actually figure some of this stuff out and not just try to uh, sell, right. you know, the, the hot uh, genetic. Right. You've already criticized the bud tender. So I'm assuming you don't want to be like the equivalent in, in the mushroom space. Of, well, of those guys, yeah. Yeah, of what they are now. I want to be Just what they science. could be. They have yes. potential to help a lot of people. Right. I'm with you. So this is pretty robust. I mean, four labs, 13 samples per lab. So that's, you know, maybe from a scientific perspective, that's a pretty small sample. But for citizen science, that's pretty impressive. Um, yeah, all things considered, it was um, I was very happy with it. There was actually two other lab results that were supposed to be included. There were supposed to be six total. So okay. we only got four back. Like I said, I thought we were going to get none of the results back or like nobody was going to mail in samples or they were going to get lost in the mail or any number of things. So like right. I was actually very surprised and very, extremely happy. I love about how, how skeptical you were about your entire process. And yet then it just. It all worked out. That's great. So now you said there were six labs. The what happened to the other two labs? They didn't. They changed their mind, or okay. So technically, um, one of the labs is already included. They got a new um, HPLC or whatever, a new s system for testing after they had already done our test. But they said they had enough of each sample or most of the samples that they could run okay. almost the entire thing again and give us another set. Um, mm -hmm. But that never happened. And then I see. the other lab, there there was an additional fifth lab. Um, so there would have been six different results, five different labs. I see. Uh, the okay. fifth lab um, had issues. They kept uh, giving me, they're a known cannabis extractor um, and known cannabis uh -huh. consultant and person. Um, and so I was excited to work with them. Uh, and then they kept giving me the classic cannabis runaround of right. next week, next week, tomorrow, later today, later today, later today. And you gave up. And that, this this have, this went on for five months because it was supposed to be at the New Year's. And then it was around like April or May where I just had to call it. And they had told me, I think like the owner of their lab, uh, 
went to prison for felony animal abuse or something. And this is like five months later, they finally told me this or something along those lines. Um, mm-hmm. You know, classic cannabis run around. Um, so we unfortunately were not able to use them. And then it seems like that person is back like up and running doing their thing without a, a problem. So I don't know what the story is there. So really. now the, these four labs, the are they are all still in operation. I believe so. Okay. Yes, some of them are actually accredited, and that's okay. that's the thing too. I don't I don't want to put anybody on blast because a lot of them, right. um, like we're honestly helping me out, not really charging me much, and you know what I mean. We're all just trying to essentially learn together. So right. it's like, I don't know. I'm not really trying to put anybody on blast right now. Right, right. Um, I and mean, like we're not, I said, we're, we're not going to name names, so it's some all of them good. are actually accredited. So I don't want to put anybody at risk. Right. Also, there you go. I get it. I appreciate that. So, so let's just let's look at line number one, Avalanche. You got lab two, three, and four looking pretty close. Yeah. I mean, lab two and four might as well be the same damn lab. Yeah, they were almost identical. So now my initial thought, and now as I'm just scanning down, lab two and four are frequently very close. My thought on that is they're running the same protocol and they're being, you know, they're being a good little lab in the same way as the other one. So that would be my assumption of why those numbers are so close. Yes, and also I believe one of them used to be employed by the other. The other one. In some there you go. Likely the same form. protocol. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so that that makes total sense. But that's good information to have, right? If you like Lab Two and a guy that used to work at Lab Two now is running Lab Four, great. If Lab Two's busy, you got Lab Four. Same difference. I'll that like. and I've also heard that um, even at the same lab, having two different people run the exact same thing on the same equipment in the same lab, you can have different results. So to have them yeah, man. across town getting the same thing, it, it that's actually, I would say leaning more towards accurate i i like that that's like one of my favorite restaurants in la is this place it's a thai place called wat dong moon luck and uh <laughs> if you go there the night that the grandpas work in there it's the best food you've <laughs> ever had in your entire life and if it's the other guy it it's like every other show not so much <laughs> yeah. so i get it yeah the the cook the cook in the kitchen matters yeah for sure you know, do you got do you got a lab rat running running the machine, or do you got the guy with the PhD running the machine? Exactly, it's going to be a difference. Definitely yeah. going to be a difference. Um, and then you got lab one. I mean, I'm sure there's plenty of unscrupulous motherfuckers who would love to hire lab one. <laughs> exactly. Uh, although they're also then kind of hit or miss because then you look at like Yeti X Melmac, and and they're they're not quite as high, but overall they seem to they seem to. Their protocol favors better numbers for sure. Yeah. So so now this sample that I pulled is this. You have done this once, right? You've done a 2022 run of yeah. this. And then you are organizing another one, but it has not happened yet. Yeah, it uh, okay. is currently postponed. I had to move unexpectedly. So okay. I'm going to wait until to see where I end up. That makes total sense. So I, and I'm going to tell you this right now. I'm not going to say that I'm a naysayer or a, a hater of these cups, but I am definitely the guy going, what are we accomplishing with these cups? I don't, right? not a lot yet is my honest to God take. This at least, this is almost like a HPLC cup. This is like who's right? Like we're learning more about the lab than than we are necessarily about the fruit. Sometimes exactly so this is that kind of cool. The goal. <laughs> it's a it's just a little something extra. And boy, man, for two hundred bucks, I get I get my sample tested at four labs. That's yeah, I can't steal, remember man. the actual price of that of the first round. I think it was like three. Or maybe oh. three fifty. Okay, and so then that, I think for about... that same price uh, is what we we're trying to do the next round, but we're okay. gonna have twice as many labs plus the at home. Uh, oh wow! Two okay. at home methods as well. I like that. So this is good because uh, I and we just talked to the guys right from 
a year ago when I had Jordan and George on to now, there are more labs. There are just yeah. more labs. And that's only going to keep growing. And I imagine you're going to have way more of those unscrupulous cannabis HPLC labs meandering and making their way over here because everybody's revenues are down over in that space. Mm -hmm. Everybody sees what's going on over here. And they already, they've run those businesses in cannabis. And now all they got to do is go, it just, it's not weed anymore. Now it's yep. shrooms. Okay, easy peasy. Let's do this. So I think that you did this is a really important point for everybody watching to understand that there will be labs that don't give a shit. Yeah. <laughs> Just don't. And they will be popular labs. They will be. You'll popular. see their, their sticker on every package. Yeah. Cause who doesn't, right? I mean, <laughs> who wants to say they got a, a mediocre potency product? They don't want to uh say that. That's another issue that I couldn't really highlight with the the data was um, even even with the most accurate labs or inaccurate labs or whatever um, in the cannabis industry, I know for a fact that you can go into these labs, a good lab or a bad lab, and you can slip them as low as even $100 and get whatever paperwork you want for whatever product, pass it on mold, pass well, on. That's bad. That's bad labs. Yeah, that's well, not I a mean, good lab. I, I know mean, what you're saying. I mean, you mean they seem wise. like they should be good? Yeah. I mean, skill set wise. Right. Yeah. yeah. Like so that's not couldn't, science. Couldn't anymore. be accurate if they tried. Some of them are up to nefarious things, but they right. they could be accurate if they tried. So so things to look out for: accreditation. Like, uh, are are you trying? You know, how transparent are you? How many internal control sets do you have? all the different way, you, you know, uh, we just talked to the guys and they're like, yeah, standards, you know, if you use them right away, great. If they sit on the shelf for a while, how do you know when they're not, you know, are they evaporating? Then they're condensing. They're not quite the same anymore. There's like all these factors that go into trying to be really accurate and all those, all the effort that goes into being very accurate costs money. But like you're saying, most people are motivated for a high number. So there's no motivation for these guys to be super, super accurate. They don't, yep. they don't care. So now I don't feel that way about any of the guys I had on tonight. I, I, I do want to say that um, their scientific rigor is obvious. And some stories that we didn't even get into that I heard that, you know, for non-disclosure reasons, they couldn't get into in, in any detail. I can tell you right now, some of these guys are eating thousands of dollars in standards and repeating tasks just because they want to make sure they're right about something. Yeah, that's good, though. That's, that's awesome. who you want. That's, that's what it's going to take, you know. Yes, because like you're saying, you're going, you know, I'm I'm breeding cubes, I'm isolating, uh, I'm trying to, you, you know, instead of breeding for morphology you're breeding for uh psilocybin content whether it's increasing the potency of a strain or it's just getting a consistency of potency for a strain and the only way you know that is by having data that you can trust so you you were very motivated you want to find out who is who's really doing it and so i i, I commend you for that i think that's pretty great now let me i pulled this up so we kind of went over this. Now, it's interesting. I didn't know this about you that you are a Woodlover fan. Um, but yeah, yeah it was definitely. Very, it was very cool to see some Millennii, some Cyanescence in there. Um, that's good. That's important. I think we're going to see a lot more of that stuff. And who knows what else is in some of those? Yeah, that was um, so what I'm really Lucas, interested in, too, is the yeah. secondary. Sorry, what was that? I was like, you know. Are there beta glucans in there? What else is in there? You know, yeah, exactly. There and could be a whole other set of stuff that's playing a role in the entourage effect that's affecting the 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 pharmacology of it all once it hits your body, once it crosses the blood brain barrier. There's all sorts of other things we just don't have any clue about yet. So to me, that that's why testing would be really important or accurate testing would be really important. Yeah. It's not about the number of something that I'm going to eat or somebody's going to eat. It's about a starting point for genetic yep. project yep. that's going to be generations and generations down the line. 
And that testing right. is just going to save me a, several generations and a lot of time and money. Because if I yeah. start at a, a better starting point that's got 0 0.001 baocystin, you know, then I, uh, that's going to be better than not to try to right. get those and the other ones into detectable and um, extractable amounts that could end up benefiting a lot of people and having other applications that we don't even think about. I've been hearing a lot about um, pain relief in mushrooms, too. Yep. I'm definitely... <laughs> interesting that, in a, so, a couple of so those that's right looking now. that's looking like that might be it's pain reduction because it's got an anti an, anti-inflammatory property to it and yeah there's a there's a, a study uh michael mamas talks about this one all the time it's this uh study on natalensis now what yeah. what i've been shopping it up with folks about recently is this if you pull that paper up and you go in their materials and methods section they, because my first thought was, where'd they get this Natalensis culture, and where are these guys from? Well, they were South African researchers, and did they go to the Natal coast and and source their own, you know, Natalensis? Did they hire a mycologist to confirm that this is actually Natalensis? Did they do ITS against the holotype? They none of that. They bought yeah. it from an online spore company. <laughs> And, yeah. and so they might have a cubensis. Exactly. We yeah. Don't know. So if, <laughs> my first and it, thought. <laughs> if that's true, then it's actually on one level, you to, you get to go, yeah, you guys suck. Uh, thank you for figuring stuff out. Maybe figure out the right species. That would also be great. If you're going to develop a natural product, if you're going to say something about a species, make sure you get your species right. But more importantly, if that's an lenses culture, that is the same one we're running. Um, it might be a cube. It might be a gnat. It might be an isolation of a gnat. It might be an isolation of a cube. And then if we can prove that that actually was, was a cubensis culture, then the question is, are all cubes anti-inflammatory in nature or are certain isolations that we've developed within our community have more of that property than others? Because if we can find out that Shakti is more anti-inflammatory in nature than albino riptide, now we have useful information. This goes back to your your whole, you know, I, I have a dream that bud tenders can actually be, <laughs> you, you know, helpful. And, yes. and that's where that information comes from. Definitely. So this and there's is the, all... uh, there's a Johns Hopkins study with rusty white cubensis isolation. I don't know if you saw that of having anti-inflammatory properties. Um, but again, oh, I, I, couldn't, that one. Okay. I couldn't find anything on if they tried other... Right. cubensis isolations other than the rusty white or if that was the only one they tried if they tried other mushrooms other than the cubensis right. um so yeah that it's that's definitely the question is is it the psilocybin that's just making you know just loosening you up or is it right. actually uh there's some other alkaloids that have anti-inflammatory properties right the other thing because i deal with this clinically is a lot of people have these chronic pain issues and sometimes there's a mechanical physical explanation for it and then other times it's more like uh we see uh fibromyalgia yeah and 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 sometimes the people that have fibromyalgia uh, i'm not even gonna lie i'm not gonna sugarcoat it we think they're just making the shit up yeah i've heard that i've definitely heard we that. just I'm, there are some people that are obviously in pain. There are other people where we feel like it is a mental component, Yeah, but it could be because there's, you know, there's me when I stab myself with a fork and it's hitting a nerve ending and it's sending that information, but the actual experience of pain is up here. Yeah, exactly. So if these are psychotropic drugs that we're playing around with, what else is it doing? Sure, the, the it's hitting a, a serotonin receptor and it's doing stuff up there. Is there other receptors it's doing stuff to? Is the confirmation of that that binding property um, with that compound is that changing other neurobiochemistry that's that's having that? We don't know any of that shit. Yeah, none of that. But we got to start doing. We got to start somewhere. We got to find first. We got to know what's in what. But yeah, that's that's where I like Step to. One kind of drive the point of where testing could actually come in handy because people I, i'm essentially like debunking it <laughs> and yeah and then also i'm like super into some of these numbers and people are like wait i thought you said it was all bullshit and it's like well it's not like all bullshit it's just those numbers with a grain of salt in the right context right. could could lead to a lot of good projects exactly 
I mean, make no mistake about it. Even when, so the first episode I did with George, he said that he's done testing where samples from a single tub had a threefold variability in potency. Oh, for so, sure. So you got a threefold variability in potency in one tub. And then you, at the same time, you got scientists who are doing novel species papers and then describing a potency for a mushroom based likely based on one fruit that they sent to yeah. HPLC, not a, not a large data set to conclusively say, this is the range of potency. The wood lover pickers will attest, or at least I will agree to that as well, that even mushrooms from the same patch yeah. or the same cluster, you'll eat one every day for weeks, and it's the same thing, same thing, and then one of them just out of nowhere is, is the one. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah, man. I was just talking about how you can, uh, you know, on some of these albino fruits, the, especially the slower growing ones, you're harvesting them. And and you cut them and they blew, you know, we use the phrase blue on break, you know, they're dephosphorylating rapidly. You can just watch them turn blue. And then you'll, you'll do that for a few mushrooms and you're like, cool. Wow. These look potent. And then you'll do, do it to another one right next to them and it won't blue on break. Yeah. And you're like, oh, is there no psilocybin in this one? And why not? It looks just like the other ones. What? And then you got. You got the tiniest little pen that you're like, oh, I'm just going to eat this one for my microdose for today. And you're like, oh, that was a heavy museum dose. Like, yeah, we don't know where the psilocybin's going. <laughs> yeah. And I actually have a theory, too, that I think even the exact same amount, like, say, even an extract psilocybin, uh, if you take that every day or like, say, once once a month or once a week, whenever, whenever you take it, the same amount in the same set and setting, say it's say it's as controlled as can be. Yeah, I think even that same dose will affect you differently. That's just what psilocybin does and like other psychedelics, even more so like LSD and stuff. And that's why I actually tend to not enjoy them as much where it's it's almost like that's how it works, even in the same dose is that it affects you randomly and differently, even in the same set and setting. <laughs> Um, that's just kind of the nature of psychedelics. It makes your interpretation of reality not what it's supposed to be. Right. So you're, yeah, you, you kind of just nailed it. You're like, please accurately describe your experience that you had while your consciousness and your sense of reality was completely altered. Yeah. Who's to say, how, you know, how, I've, and that's the other thing too. I've, I've had people uh, be like, oh, I don't really feel it, you know, but their eyes are huge dinner plates, you know, <laughs> giant pupils and like they're right. acting kind of weird and they're laughing and all this stuff. Yeah. And they're like, yeah, I didn't really feel it. You know, it's like people kind of remember it differently sometimes. Like if you, yeah. if you, uh, you know, alone in silent darkness versus not alone in silent darkness, you know, sensory right. deprivation, like it's going to affect you differently in a different yeah. set and setting. So like, I don't know. Um, I think that definitely plays in the potency as well. So like the subject, it's almost like you can't even trust the subjective re review just in the nature right. of, of right. the medicine. So and all that's going to drive the FDA crazy and yeah. Pfizer crazy <laughs> because they just want to go, here's the pill. This is what it does. 90% yep. of the time. <laughs> yeah. That, you know, it's too shamanistic. It's too variable. It's like, yeah, the same, the same blue pill. If I'm sitting, laying in my bed, listening to, you know, Led Zeppelin, it's going to do a completely different thing when I, when I close my eyes than if I'm wandering around the woods with two friends. Yeah, exactly. Why? I don't know. Well, because it's my freaking brain. Yeah. <laughs> it's only it directly works. affecting my brain. Yep. So what are you what are you going to do? But I I I still think we should know what's in these things. We should really. This is the next step. We have figured out how to breed for, for morphology. We have done, you know, I mean, Dave Wombat by himself has done an incredible amount of work in, in that regard. And then yeah. really important people like Workman or uh, Roger Rabbit, all these guys that really did like seminal work and, and yeah, you know, Jick Fibs, you know, isolating uh, TAT and the TAT. Yeah. Th this, this stuff is important, but now that we've played games with how they look, for me, truly, the next phase is let's get a little bit more serious about what's in them and some effort to figure out what each component of what's in them might or might not be doing for us. And to maybe stabilize them, too. 
because um, this is a, a great example, actually, is from the cup, uh, my, my cup, the Fino Hunters Ball. Um, I just got to give a shout out real quick to the uh, M670 was the winner um, from Teddy Forgotten Fruits. Uh, this is a perfect example, though, of like um, stability in the strains and uh, I should just say success rate overall. Because mm-hmm. that M670 was, it tested at like 2.8% total average. Um, and then the Shakti got second place. That was from Trip Labs, um, TRYP. There's a couple different Trip Labs out there. Uh, and there will be more, my friend. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And they're all like super legit too, which is weird. Yeah. <laughs> but trip so, one, trip two, trip three, multiple trips. Yes. So the Trip Labs got second place with the Shakti Nebula at just under that at like 2.7 average. Mm-hmm. Um, but I ran a bunch of those at scale of both of them, uh, the M670 and the Shakti. And while the M670 definitely tested higher and they looked more potent and there was a couple huge ones, there was like some 800 gram ones. Um, overall, I would say it was a little bit more finicky. It threw a couple reverts here and there, like one out of every 20 tubs would be like almost all reverts. Hmm. Um, like little stubby um, kind of like half fruits um, and they would eventually blob out into the sporasis brain coral mutation but like uh, it would be like you know weeks and weeks later so I would say over time like if you're getting two or three flushes of the Shakti in second place in the time that it takes you to get one flush of something that's better that's definitely something that people right. can take into account too is that just because one is testing higher doesn't mean that it's going to be a practical yielder the M670, I would say, is a practical yielder, though. <laughs> but um, right. as in terms of the top three, uh, I would say that it was maybe not, like, the best of the top three as a practical one for yield. Um, and actually, uh, if you took out lab, which is at lab number one, the one with the most variance, it actually changes the rankings. Um, so it switches the second and third place. But they're both submitted by Trip Labs, so it's, like, the same, same person. Um, so the albino riptide, if you, I haven't grown that one, but if that one turns out to be the best yielder, the third place in my cup could have actually been, you know, the most practical choice to grow. Right. So it's like these rankings and numbers and, and uh, subjective reviews and all that stuff. Like, take all of it with a grain of salt. Like, just try, right. you know, don't take anyone's word for it, even mine. You know, <laughs> try, try everything yourself. Yes. Yeah. I- so I always think, I mean, every time I grow a bag of ape, I'm like, they're cool, but God, they take fucking forever. And like, yeah. I could have grown three tubs of just basic ass cubes in the same amount of time and probably resulted with, with net more psilocybin. Exactly. Yeah. Net like, what am I total. doing here? What am I? And especially I mean, the more um, extraction is getting popular. I've been seeing just in the last week, I've seen like 10 different extraction texts that looked really interesting. Yeah. Um, so I'm thinking the net uh, might be your best bet. <laughs> oh, I'm with you. I'm yeah. If if that's the game I'm playing, I'm growing the most vigorous, fastest, basic ass cube I can get my hands on. Yeah, speed Easy. usually helps. <laughs> yes, fast. Get them in, get them out, extract them. Next, next, yep. next, next. <laughs> and that because... helps with pheno hunting too, because you see it. It's like instant gratification. You remember your starting yep. point. It's not like months later you forgot what you were even going for <laughs> yeah true it's all true cool man all right let's pull this back all right well so i i had to have you on when, when i was doing this hplc episode when i was putting it all together I, in the back of my head i was like and i'm having this guy on gotta have this guy on we we, we got to talk about this so this is gonna be uh this is the cherry on top right here is this is how it brings it all back home to the community you know, somebody that, that took the next step. I'm always talking about what's the one more thing that you can do. You know, cool. You grow mushrooms, you do it for your health, you do it to pay the rent, whatever you're doing it for. But then now what's the thing you can do to give back to the community? This was a wonderful idea. I look forward to the next one and the next one. And uh, maybe one day you'll, you'll be the guy running the first official uh, proficiency center for, for mushrooms. That would be cool. Yeah, definitely, man. Right. Well, I, I definitely appreciate you having me on. Uh, it's a huge honor that you're even thinking of me and mentioning me. 
in the conversation. Well, you're doing um, it. You're doing the stuff. Yeah, I have a lot less resources than a lot of the people in the space, and it's really difficult to keep going most days. So it's it means a lot to to get recognized. So thank you. Well, so let me say this: you're welcome for whatever little thing I did having you on here. But most importantly, let me say thank you because you're a great example then of you got this guy with all the money in the world and he didn't choose to do this. And you came up, you were clever. You came up with a way of making it fun, getting people involved. Um, I mean, your, your value add proposition is fantastic because you've just instantly improved for anybody that really wants to know what a sample's looking like getting results from more than one lab is, is priceless. So, I think it's great. I look forward to you getting settled wherever you get, wherever you're moving. And I'm ready for round two and round three. And as all these labs keep coming, we'll hopefully you'll be keeping track of them. Yeah. I look forward to it, man. Cool, man. All right. Thank you so much. And uh, we'll talk soon. All right. Thank you. All right, guys, that was plum of fresh air exchange. Uh, looking forward to, all the other great ideas I am almost certain this guy is going to have and execute on. Uh, I, I love the doers, not the sayers. Uh, love it when you when you be about it and not just talk about it. And that's exactly what he did. And I really commend him for that. So anyway, we've had quite an episode. We've talked to a lot of people. Uh, you guys all now get your little honorary HPLC uh, certification program course certificates. Um, those will be in the mail. Um I just got to go buy stamps first, guys. Anyway, so thank you so much for tuning in. I had a blast. Um, and, you know, this HPLC of it all, it's going to continue to evolve. We're going we're gonna to keep learning more things we can do with it. I can tell you for certain, the Michael Hollick's, uh Facebook group that I started not too long ago with a bunch of people, um, we are almost certainly going to be getting into some citizen science projects involving HPLC. So stay tuned for some of the results from that you know, in the next year or so. And uh, so again, don't forget next week, we got Dave Wombat. He's done a couple things. He's moved around, um, you know, and, and he's still alive and kicking and we're going to find out what he's been up to. So uh, until next week, go grow some mushrooms. Mm -hmm.